Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. Uh, we got an awesome debate tonight. However, uh, I want to point out that there could be some technical problems. Uh, namely, I am in the I'm the one that's hosting this. Uh, so they're on with me via Skype, and I'm um, live streaming to YouTube. However, there is a massive storm outside, and power hasn't gone out yet, but power does tend to go out periodically when there are storms. So basically, if our if our power goes out, we'll try logging on uh, very try logging back on very quickly. Uh, if if it happens again, then we'll probably uh, postpone the rest of the debate or redo it or something like that next week when there's not a storm. But uh, hopefully we don't have any problems. And um, we're, we're going to go ahead and get started here in a minute. I uh, just wanted the uh, debaters to introduce themselves. Um, Anthony, why don't you go ahead and tell everyone a little bit about yourself and why you think this is an important topic to debate. Yeah, uh, my name's Anthony Rogers. I studied at Christ College. I studied Christian philosophy there. I also went on to receive a divinity degree from Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, I've been involved in apologetics for almost three decades. I especially focus on Islam, which uh, is not because I don't think it's important to get the God everyone, but there's a special need there, and uh, there are other reasons for that, but uh, that also ties in with my interest in debating uh, someone like Carlos, who would dub himself a biblical Unitarian. Uh, anybody who's interacted much with Muslims knows that uh, they often appeal to the work of biblical Unitarians in their efforts to oppose the, the truth of Christ, and so I'm not only interested in uh, debating Unitarians because I disagree with uh, their anti-Trinitarianism, but also because uh, they're very useful to other groups like Muslims. All right, and uh, our other debater is Carlos Xavier. And Carlos, why don't you go introduce yourself for everyone? Well, first, thank you, Anthony, for accepting my debate invite. Thank you, David, for hosting it and moderating it. So I was born in Nicaragua in Central America, and I grew up agnostic before converting to what I like to call Christian Unitarian view. I know it's known as, uh, Anthony said, as Biblical Unitarian in history, but I prefer Christian Unitarian. And I converted to that in my early 30s. I was 32, 33. I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I work for Restoration Fellowship, which was founded by Sir Anthony Buzzard. He's my father-in-law. Uh, so I manage the our YouTube Restoration Fellowship channel. So that's youtube.com forward slash Restoration Fellowship, one word. I also manage the humanjesus.org. That's the humanjesus.org and christenemylove.com websites. And on our channel, I have hosted uh, many notable scholars, uh, evangelical Protestant scholars like Dr. Larry Hurtado, Dr. Daniel Kirk, and recently historian Richard Rubinstein, or Rubinstein. You can watch my other debates with Jonathan McLachey and Ethan Smith and uh, Mark Stengler Jr. on our YouTube channel. So thank you. All right. So thank you, Anthony and Carlos. Um, I'm going to run over the format very quick, but uh, Anthony, before I do that, could you tilt your camera down slightly? Yeah, we're, we're significantly higher than you, and it makes you look uh, like a little tiny guy. There you go. There you go. And plus, I wanted to see well, your... Uh, I want, plus, I wanted to see your awesome shirt when you lean back. What's it say? It National, says, National Sarcastic Society? <laughs> like we need your support. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, guys, uh, we got a uh, fairly lengthy debate ahead of us, so we want to get started. Let me go have, go over the format very quickly. So Anthony Rogers will be on the affirmative. Carlos Xavier will be on the negative. The topic is, did Paul, that's the Apostle Paul here, did Paul teach that Jesus is God? The format will be as follows. Uh, each participant will give a 20-minute opening statement. And Carlos uh, is going to use a PowerPoint. I'm new to this, so... Uh, if there are any technical difficulties, we'll, we'll bear that in mind. That won't count against this time, but shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, then we'll have first rebuttals of 12 minutes each. We'll have cross-examinations of 10 minutes each. 
And so, by the way, guys, how did you want to do the cross-examination? Uh, uh, for the affirmative, we'll be asking questions, and the negative will be answering for 10 minutes and then reverse that? Yeah. That's correct? Okay. And <clears throat> then we'll have a second round of rebuttals of eight minutes each, and then concluding statements for each side of five, minute each, and five minutes each, and then we will have 15 minutes of Q&A from the audience, and I'll try to go back and forth. So if you have questions, I probably won't be paying attention to your questions as we're going through this because uh, the debaters are going to be debating and won't be taking questions in. However, once they give their concluding statements, that is an excellent time to uh, post your questions for both uh, debaters. If you get a chance, post, you know, mark very clearly who it's for. So question for Anthony or question for Carlos, uh, because I'm going to try and go back and forth with the questions. All right. So I think we're all set up. And uh, all right. So, Anthony, are you ready? Get my, I'm ready. Get my stopwatch. And I'm going to just put Anthony up on the screen here. And whoops. You have 20 minutes, sir. Okay, I want to begin by giving all praise and thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom belongs blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Before presenting my positive case, I want to make three caveats. First, while I believe that God's revelation is thoroughly rational and accept reason as a tool for apprehending and receiving what God reveals, I reject the rationalism or man-centered principles that so-called libertarians in the Bible and used to reject anything they don't fully comprehend. Uh, for example, in a book on the Trinity and Deity of Christ written by Hunting and Buzzard, the latter of whom Carlos just mentioned as his father-in-law, they wrote, We wonder how normally reasonable people can so readily accept what is ultimately declared to be an incomprehensible mystery. In opposition to this, Paul said that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, true philosophy, are deposited in Christ. And so truth is determined not by what's fully comprehensible to us, but by what conforms to the revelation of Christ, who knows all things. Accordingly, as a Christian, I heed Paul's warning, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him, Paul says, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, Colossians 2. In light of this, a better name for this movement would be Unitarian or autonomous Unitarianism, anything but biblical Unitarianism. Second, in arguing that Christ taught the deity of Christ, which entails that Jesus is co-essential and co-equal with God the Father, all the fullness of deity, I'm not arguing that Jesus is equal to what autonomous Unitarians mean by God the Father. In keeping with their rationalistic principle and rejection of anything they can't fully comprehend, Historically, they have taught that God as God has a body of some sort, is subject to temporal and spatial constraints, and does not have exhaustive foreknowledge of the future. Such a conception of God is patently unbiblical and idolatrous, and I'm certainly not arguing that Jesus is equal to that. Their God is not the infinite God who caused Paul to cry out, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways! Third, in arguing that Christ is God, I'm not denying the and subordination of Jesus to the Father. I agree with Paul when he said in 1 Timothy 2.5, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. However, while affirming the humanity and subordination of Christ to the Father, I insist on the basis of Scripture that this is because the Lord Jesus, without ceasing to be God, Lord, Son, etc., became a man and humbled himself for the sake of redeeming mankind. Romans 1.3, the Son was made a descendant of David according to the flesh. Galatians 4.4, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law. With those caveats in mind, when it comes to my positive case, interestingly enough, I'm in broad agreement with Carlos's father-in-law when he says in the book previously mentioned, quote, the Trinitarian problem must be analyzed from the perspective of Paul's strictly monotheistic Jewish background, Luke's reports of Paul's ministry and acts, and Paul's recorded epistles, end quote. Accordingly, it's to the first of these I now. While Paul was steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, which clearly teach the oneness or unity of God, Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema, 
that unity, as explicated by the Old Testament itself, is a unity of persons, as Trinitarians believe, not a unity of nothing, as Unitarians believe. This is apparent from multiple lines of evidence. For example, there are passages where God speaks self-referentially in the plural, like Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image, also found in 3.22, 11.7, and Isaiah 6.8. There are also passages where others refer to God in the plural, like Genesis 20:13, where Abraham says of God, they caused me to wander, or 35:7, they revealed themselves to him, or Deuteronomy 4:7, they drew near, and so on. There are also passages that involve a subject-object distinction in God, like Genesis 19:24, where it says the inside Lord caused it to rain fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. There are passages where God speaks about God, like Isaiah 20, or, uh, Exodus 24, 1, where the Lord says to Moses, come up the mountain to Yahweh. Uh, the same thing is seen in passages like Genesis 35, 1, Hosea 1, 7, and so on. There are also passages where God speaks of being sent by God, like Isaiah 48, 16, where the first and the last says, the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. The same thing can be seen in Zechariah 2, 6 through 12. Now, the broad lines of this evidence is filled in and brought into specific focus in what the Old Testament says about three persons in particular, namely the Father, the angel of his presence, and the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah 63, for example, the redemption of Israel from Egypt is attributed to the saving activity of all three. And throughout the Old Testament, the angel and the spirit are identified as divine persons. For example, the angel of the Lord... Hebrew that does not create an angel, is explicitly identified as Yahweh in Hosea 12, 4 through 5. Quote, Jacob wrestled with the angel and overcame. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel. Even Yahweh, the God of hosts, Yahweh is his memorial name. As for the spirit, he is likewise identified as a divine person. 2 Samuel 23, 2 through 3, David says, The spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. Accordingly, when Isaiah 63 attributes Israel's redemption to the Father, the angel of his presence, and the Holy Spirit, he's speaking of three divine persons, which in turn explains why God speaks in the plural, why God's referred to in the plural, why God talks about God, refers to God, why he speaks of God sending God or being sent by God. In addition, the same Old Testament scriptures teach the deity of the Messiah who was to come. He's one of those divine persons. To as Emmanuel, meaning God with us. That this isn't merely a theophoric name is evident just two chapters later in Isaiah 9 6, where Messiah is identified as El Gibor, the mighty God, a phrase in Isaiah that refers to Yahweh alone, Isaiah 10 21. Later in Isaiah 40, verse 3, the coming one is referred to as Yahweh. Lord and Eloheinu, our God. In Jeremiah 23.6, uh, 23, he's referred to as Yahweh Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Malachi 3.1, he's referred to as Ha Adon, the Lord, a construction used exclusively for Yahweh. In Zechariah 12.10, Yahweh says they will look upon me whom they have pierced. Micah 5.2 says his goings forth are from of old, from the days of eternity. In Psalm 45, God says of the Messiah, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. In Psalm 102, he is described as the unchanging God who made heaven and earth. In Psalm 110, 1 and verse 5, Messiah, who's at God's right hand, is referred to both Abi and Adonai, the latter of which is an exclusively divine title. Moreover, as has become increasingly more apparent in the last 30 years through a close reading of ancient sources, the fact that God is multipersonal and that the coming Messiah would be God in the flesh was believed by the vast majority of Jews during the Second Temple period, which has outmoded much of liberal and critical scholarship which tried to say that this was derived from Gentile pagan sources. This is why, for example, Daniel Boyer, an Orthodox Jew and scholar of ancient Judaism, could say in his book, The Jewish Gospels, quote, the ideas of the Trinity and Incarnation, or certainly the germs of those ideas, were already present among Jews before Jesus came on the scene. This is also why Jacob Neusner, one of the most well-known and widely celebrated scholars of Judaism, could say on page 275 of his book, Judaisms and Their Messiahs at the Turn of the Christian Era, quote, earlier systems of Judaism resorted to the myth 
Messiah, a Savior and Redeemer of Israel, even a God-man facing the crucial historical questions of Israel's life and resolving them. And quote, with respect then to the first issue, the Jewish monotheism that formed and informed the thinking of Paul, it was certainly not rationalistic Unitarian monotheism or anti-incarnational messianism. There's no evidence that Saul, prior to his conversion, rejected the view of his kinsmen that God is multipersonal or that Messiah would be the Lord from heaven. What he stumbled over was that Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified one, was that Lord, a fact that would be resolved when he saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. Well, this brings me then to the second area of relevance, namely Luke's account of Paul in the book of Acts. Here, there's no more significant issue than what Luke tells us about Paul's conversion in Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26, when Paul came to recognize and confess Jesus as Lord, others same saving confession. To summarize these accounts, we're told that Paul, still fuming from Stephen's statement that he saw the heavens opened, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father, and crying out to Jesus in heaven as Lord, we say, we're told that Paul was on his way to Damascus when an exceedingly bright light, also called glory by Paul, suddenly flashed around him. The, bright, the light was brighter than the noonday sun. It knocked Paul and his companions to the ground and caused Paul to go blind. This led Paul, like Stephen, to cry out to his heavenly intruder, Who are you, Lord? In response to which he heard a voice speaking in Aramaic, the Chaldean tongue that they came to speak while in exile. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. This was quickly followed by words of divine commissioning. Get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you. Now, numerous scholars, Christian as well as Jewish, have observed that this encounter has all the earmarks of an Old Testament theology, particularly the appearances of God that attended the call narratives of the prophets, which were never mediated uh, through men or preachers, but always came as a direct encounter with God. For example, Craig Keener, in his monumental commentary uh, set on the book of Acts, said, Paul's experience echoes a variety of biblical theophanies and other call narratives. Now, the call narrative and uh, theophany that most resembles Paul's experience here is most instructive. Ezekiel 1 through 2 tells us that Ezekiel, at his call, while among the Jewish exiles in Chaldea, the land where they came to speak Aramaic, saw the heavens opened and saw the figure of a man, also referred to as the glory, the glory of the Lord and the God of Israel, from whose presence a bright light flashed forth continually and all around. Like Paul, when Ezekiel saw the bright light and glory that surrounded and emanated from this figure, he fell to the ground, but then heard a voice saying to him, Get up, stand on your feet that I may speak to you, followed by words of divine commissioning. Now, not only is the general tenor of this encounter the same as what happened to Saul, but many of the words and even entire phrases and whole sentences between these two events are exactly the same. Some of them only occur in the account of Ezekiel and Paul's account of his own conversion. And in fact, all of these things are listed in the exact same order as Paul gives them in Acts 26. The scholar Gilles Quispel was certainly right when he wrote in an essay on Ezekiel 126, for those familiar with the meaning and purpose of such hints in ancient literature, there cannot be the slightest doubt that the author of Acts is paralleling the vocation of Ezekiel and the vocation of St. Paul. Just as the glory appeared to the prophet in Babylonia, so the glory appeared to Saul near Damascus. Jewish scholar Alan Siegel in his book, Paul the Convert, the Apostolate and Apostasy of Saul the Pharisee, admits the same thing as do many others. The upshot is simply this. As a Hebrew at the feet of Gamaliel, Paul was certainly familiar with such things. The parallels would not have been lost on Paul, who got his categories and modes of thought from the Bible, not the Talmud or medieval rabbis or 16th century Socinian or biblical Unitarian rationalists. This brings me finally to Paul's own writings, where we find exactly what we would expect given all that we've already heard. First, among Paul's many citations of the Old Testament, over a dozen of them include a reference to the Lord, which is Yahweh in the Hebrew text, the name of the God of Israel. Significantly, Paul applies half of these references to the Father and the other half to the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, in Romans 10, Paul says uh, one is saved by confessing Jesus as Lord, and he goes on to say, For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a quotation of Joel 2.32, where the word for Lord is Yahweh. 
In Romans 14, 11, after saying that Jesus and that all men will answer to him, he goes on to quote Isaiah 45, 23. As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me. The same passage is applied again to Jesus in Philippians 2.10. In, Philippi, uh, in 1 Corinthians 1.31, after putting down any notion that salvation is of ourselves, Paul goes on to say that Christ is our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. This quote comes from Jeremiah 9.23-24, through 24, and is applied again to Jesus in 2 Corinthians 10.17. In, second, uh, in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul quotes Isaiah 40 when arguing that believers have the mind of the Lord, that is, the mind of Christ. In 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 26, Paul teaches that believers belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore all things pertaining to food and drink are lawful for us. For the earth is the Lord's and all things quotation 24 1 which says the earth is the Lord's Yahweh and all it contains I could go on with this but uh, my second point from Paul's teaching is that in addition to Old Testament Yahweh texts applied to Jesus there are reoccurring stock and trade phrases for Yahweh found in the Old Testament that every Jew would have been familiar with and in every case Paul uses them for Jesus and Jesus alone for example over and over again scripture speaks of the righteous as those who Call upon the name of the Lord, Genesis 4:26. And yet Paul uses this stereotypical phrase for Jesus or for Christians in the New Testament. He says in 1 Corinthians 1:2, "All who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ." Those are believers. Scores of times the prophets speak of the day of the Lord. Isaiah 13:6, "Wail for the day of the Lord is near; it will come as destruction from the Almighty." Paul uses the same phrase for Jesus, 1 Corinthians 5. I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord, Jesus. The Old Testament often speaks of the fear of the Lord, a phrase used for Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.11. The Old Testament often uses the phrases by the word of the Lord and the coming of the Lord, both of which are used for Jesus in 1 Thessalonians 4.15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Again, I could give several more examples of this, really three dozen more examples, all used exclusively for Jesus. But here's the upshot. This is exactly what we would expect to find if Paul taught and believed that Jesus is Yahweh, and not at all what we would expect if Paul were a post-Christian rationalistic Unitarian. Third, if that's not bad enough, consider the following. If we set aside all this evidence, as Carlos is going to try and uh, do in a moment, we have to ask, what is the one Lord of the Shema of Israel in the writings of Paul? If you follow Carlos and other biblical Unitarians, then you can't point to Old Testament Lord texts used for the Father because they're also used for Jesus. And if they don't prove that Jesus is Lord in the Old Testament sense, they also can't be used to prove that the Father is the one Lord. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. You can't logically infer from the same evidence two opposite conclusions without being arbitrary and violating basic canons of logic. This means, in order to answer the question with Carlos, you'd have to look outside of Old Testament Lord texts. But the problem here is that the Father is never called Lord outside of the six times Paul cites the Old Testament. All of the stock and trade Yahweh phrases used by Paul, like those I just mentioned, are used for Jesus. And all of the hundreds of other times that Paul uses the term Lord, it's always, always, always for Jesus. In fact, the only time Paul ever uses the expression, one Lord, Kyrios Heis, the, the very language of the Shema is in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. For us there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. Or Ephesians 4, 5, in reference to Jesus. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Once again, this is exactly what we would expect to find if Paul taught that Jesus is Yahweh, God, and not at all what we would expect if Paul was a forerunner and advocate of autonomous Unitarianism. Fourth, if Paul taught that Jesus is Yahweh, then we would expect him to ascribe to Jesus 
the attributes, works, and worship that belong to God alone. And he certainly did. In Colossians 1.17, Paul ascribes eternity to Jesus. He is before all things, Paul says. And because Jesus is eternal, Paul could say that Jesus was with the Israelites in the wilderness, 1 Corinthians 10. Jesus is from heaven, 1 Corinthians 15. He first descended from heaven to earth before he ascended from the heavens. If he, he was rich, but for our sins became poor, 2 Corinthians 8. And while existing in the form of God and being equal with God, he took the form of a servant, a bondservant, and was made in the likeness of men, Philippians 2. Moreover, as the eternally pre-existent Lord, Paul also says that all things were created in him, through him, and for him, Colossians 1.16, 1 Corinthians 8.6, One minute. and that he is the providential sustainer of all things. In him all things hold together, Colossians 1.17, the same thing Paul says about the Father in Acts 17. And because all of this is true, it's fitting that Paul would offer up religious service and worship to Christ as Lord. In Colossians 3.17, Paul said, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. In Romans 14, Colossians 3.23, Paul says, Whether we eat or drink, observe this day or that, uh, whether we live or die, we are to do it all for the Lord Jesus. Also prayed to Christ, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 Thessalonians 3, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 Timothy 1. He instructed believers to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to the Lord Jesus in Ephesians 5. In addition, and I conclude with this, Paul also offers up doxologies to Christ, a Jewish religious practice reserved for Yahweh alone. 2 Timothy 4.18 the Lord, Jesus, that is, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, Anthony, I didn't want you to, I didn't want to cut you off in the middle of that verse, but you went about 18 seconds over, so I will award uh, an 18 second uh, window at the end there for uh, Carlos as well. Um, you were breaking up periodically, but yes. we got we got most of your statement, uh, Anthony. Uh, so the main question is, is that uh, going from my computer to YouTube where we have an interruption, possibly due to a storm, or is it on your end? We will find out as we bring up Carlos. Now, Carlos, you wanted to use a PowerPoint, yes. correct? Let me try this. All right. And you guys tell me. All right, let me get you on here, right here. Now, do you, do you do you want your PowerPoint up instead of you? Yes, please. Thank okay, you. and if you finish it and you want me to turn that off, just go ahead and let me know. And, all right. All right, well, yep, I've got your PowerPoint up. So you, I will start your time whenever you start speaking. All right, thank you. For Paul, God is the Father. In the New Testament, the word God is the Father or equals the Father 99.5% of the time according to my Bible work software. So it's no surprise to see that for Paul, the word God corresponds to the Father at least 40 times throughout his letter. These appear most prominently and famously in the form of greetings, doxologies, and benedictions. 1 Corinthians 1, 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, yet for us, that is Christians, there is one God, the Father, all things are from him, and we exist for him. Many see behind verses like 1 Corinthians 8, 6, an allusion to the Jewish unitary creed known as the Shema, which means hear or obey, from Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, that is Yahweh, our God, or Jehovah, is one Lord. A personal name indicates one person, one individual, the Father here. So Yahweh is not just a title, but a personal divine name. And as we all know, a personal name indicates one person. Isaiah 64, 8, but now Yahweh, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are our potter. We all are the work of your hand. So for Paul, Jewish monotheism is not Trinitarian because the deity of Jesus is inherently un-Jewish, as Protestant scholar Morris Casey notes here. The witness of the uh, Jewish New Testament tech, uh, Jewish text is unvarying, he says. Belief that a second being is God involves departure from the Jewish community. 
Note how the Amplified Bible translates Galatians 3.20, for example. Yet God is only one person, and he was the sole party in giving that promise to Abraham. That's because whenever the Greek word for one, is or heis, I'm using the modern Greek uh, pronunciation, by the way, is appears in reference to theos, the word God, or kyrios, the word Lord, it means one person. The same is true for the Hebrew word, echad, when used with the divine name or its counterpart, Adonai, or even the title Elohim, the, the Hebrew word for God, for the one God of Israel. Point number two, Jesus, for Paul, Jesus is the human son of God. Paul is always contrasting the first created human with the second procreated human being. Paul explains in passages like Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 that just as death, that is sin, entered creation through the one human, Adam, eternal life comes through another human, the second Adam. This means the second Adam, the second human, Jesus, is no more pre-existent, let alone God, than the first human being, Adam. Dr. James Dunn notes that if Christ walks in Adam's footsteps, then Christ being no more pre-existent than Adam. Nor indeed is there any implication that Christ was contemporaneous with Adam, acting in a similarly transhistorical situation. As 1 Corinthians 15 insists, the temporal order is clear. So we have Adam first, Christ second, Christ is last Adam, Adam precedes Christ. Adam was not a copy of a pre-existent Christ, but a type of him who was to come, and that's Paul in Romans 5, verse 14. So, for Paul, the Son comes into existence, Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, and made under the law. The Greek, as you see there, yenomenon, from the verb yenome, according to Bauer's lexicon, means to come into being existence through the process of birth. Thayer's lexicon, to become, that is, to come into existence, begin to be, receive being. For Paul, the Son of God died because he was born. God cannot do either. Romans 5.10, once, says Paul, we were God's enemies, but we have been brought back to him because his son has died for us. And however you want to define death, God simply cannot do it. Habakkuk, the prophet, Habakkuk, I mean, uh, chapter 1, verse 12, are you not from antiquity, ancient times, O Lord, that is Yahweh Jehovah, my God, my holy sovereign, you will not die. Paul echoes the prophet in 1 Timothy 6.16. God is the only one who never dies. Point number three. For Paul, Jesus is not God. A strong argument is not called God. A strong argument can be made that Paul never even applies the term God to Jesus. That's because all of the so-called proof texts contain textual proof problems or flat-out corruptions. These indis indisputable facts have been noted by many Catholic and Protestant scholars throughout the centuries. The Catholic priest, Dutch humanist Erasmus, most famous for exposing the so-called Johannine corruption in 1 John 5, by the way, says that nowhere in Scripture is Christ called true God. It is no less absurd to say the Son is the Father because God refers to the Father, that is, the word God. Likewise, Paul says God and Father, Galatians 1, Philippians 4, pointing out one person who is both God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaac Newton, called by many the greatest scientific genius the world has known, in private letters sent to uh, philosopher John Locke, who was another closet non-Trinitarian, by the way, details findings of more than 20 passages worth of corruptions and textual problems in the New Testament. The Swiss Protestant textual scholar Johann Weitstein was the first to expose the corruption at 1 Timothy 3.16, where the word he, 
as you see here, he was manifested in the in the flesh, was changed to read God was manifest in the flesh. The noted William Barclay says that on almost every occasion in the New Testament on which Jesus seems to be called God, there is a problem either of textual criticism or of translations. In almost every case, we have to discuss which of two readings is to be accepted or which of two possible translations is to be accepted. Dr. Murray Harris, in his well-known and cited book, Jesus as God, admits that any New Testament use of the word God, Theos, as a Christological title, will produce certain linguistic anomalies and ambiguities. For in all strands of the New Testament, the word God, Theos, generally signifies the Father. It's a curious fact that each contains an interpretive problem of some description. Actually, most contain two or three. Dr. Harris adds that each of the disputed God text contains other a, a problem having to do with punctuation, as it's the case in Romans 9.5, or textual grammatical problems, 2 Thessalonians 1.12, Titus 2.13. British scholar, once again, Dr. James Dunn, adds that such verses either depend on contentious or little supported readings of the text or are later. Uh, his list includes problems, quote unquote, that involve Galatians 2.20, Colossians 2.2, 2 Thessalonians, again, 1.12, and later manuscript problems like, again, in Titus 2.13. British scholar Dr. James Dunn adds, uh, lists, sorry, uh, textual problems, as you see there. So he adds that at the same time, we should, at the same time, uh, sorry, we should recall the strong monotheistic affirmations in the pastorals, the letters of Paul, for example, 1 Timothy 1.17. Now to the king eternal, the eternal king, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one be mediator between God and humanity, Christ Jesus, himself human. Note the allusion in these verses to Psalm 110, verse 1, where the one God is Yahweh or Jehovah, and the one mediator is the human Messiah, as we will see. My last point, for Paul, Jesus is the Lord Messiah, not the Lord God. Paul uses the title Lord, Kyrios, in reference to Christ, Christos, more than 200 times. This means Jesus' Lordship is synonymous with his being the anointed Messiah Lord and not the Lord God. After all, Paul cannot possibly be teaching that Jesus is the anointed Messiah Yahweh, God in the ultimate sense. That would be nonsensical and make one Yahweh too many according to the Shema. So the word Lord, <clears throat> when used for both God and Jesus, needs to be carefully distinguished by the most used Old Testament verse by the New Testament writers, as I cited before, Psalm 110.1, a declaration of the Lord, that is Yahweh or Jehovah, to my Lord, Ladoni. This key controlling definitional verse informed and shaped Paul's famous Christological confession of Jesus is Lord. So it's amazing to find how many scholars misreport the Hebrew of, for the second Lord there, Ladoni or Adoni, my Lord, which is a word never used for God, as Adonai, which is a word only used for the Lord God. In fact, the widely cited, as you see here, Dr. David Capes, known for popularizing the phrase Yahweh text used for Jesus, teaches that the word Adonai refers to human beings quote, persons in authority like the patriarchs. Yet any standard lexicon or Bible dictionary will show this is simply not right. Adonai is the age-old, well-known and preferred word used for God alone by religious Jews instead of his divine name. This is in sharp contrast to Adoni, again, which in all 195 times in the Hebrew Old Testament is never used for God. This distinction between the two lords is also borne out in the Greek translation of Psalm 110, verse 1, where the Lord, as you see here, Okirios, says to my Lord, 
tokiriomu, that is uh, someone who is not God, because this Greek phrase, to my Lord, tokiriomu, is never used for God either. With this in mind, we can better understand Paul's repeated use of so-called Yahweh texts for Jesus 20 times throughout his letters, as what was said about the one God being applied to his human Messiah, and not because the Messiah was also somehow the same one God, let alone a second Yahweh or Jehovah. So for Paul, the great day of the Lord, that is Yahweh in Zephaniah 1, becomes the day of Christ in, in Philippians, or the day of our Lord Jesus Christ in Corinthians, or even the, the judgment seat of God in Romans 14.10 with the judgment seat of the Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.10. Paul said in his famous sermon on Mars Hill in Acts 17.31 that God has set a day when he, God, will judge the world with justice by the man he, God, has appointed. Paul's command to believers to call on the name of the Lord Christ in 1 Corinthians 1, for example, follows the well-known Old Testament calls on the name of the Lord, that is, Jehovah or Yahweh, in Joel 2.32. For Paul, Jesus is now the one and only mediator between God and human beings, as we saw in the famous verse here, 1 Timothy 2.5. Paul now identifies Christ as both the power and wisdom of God in 1 Corinthians 1. That's why if you have the mind of the Lord Christ in 1 Corinthians 2, you have both the spirit and mind of the Lord that is Yahweh from Isaiah 40. But note that Christians, we Christians, are supposed to have that same mind according to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. So instead of concluding that Jesus is somehow a second Yahweh, it's more likely from this, as Dr. Dunn notes, that Yahweh has bestowed his own unique saving power on the Lord who sits on his right side, again, Psalm 110, verse 1, or that the exalted Jesus is himself the embodiment as well as the executive of that saving power. If Psalm 110.1, says Dr. Dunn, allows the concept of two lords, the second given his plenipotentiary status by the first, then there is presumably no reason why a passage like Joel 2.32 should not be refer referred to the second lord, that is, the Lord Jesus, that God was understood to pass divine authority to others is indicated by the various individuals who were thought to play the role of heavenly judges. Dr. Dunn goes on to list such figures in Jewish tradition in, in his book here, Did the First Christians Worship Jesus, like Adam, Melchizedek, Enoch, Elijah, and even the saints. Luke 22:30, he says, Jesus says to the twelve, you will eat and drink at my table in that kingdom. You will sit on thrones and judge the twelve tribes of Israel. And then he says, Paul, to the Christian church, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? 1 Corinthians 6 again, do you not know that we will judge angels? The point is that just as God worked by and through other agents in the Old Testament, how much more by and through his unique human agent, the Messiah? This goes back to the well-known Jewish principle known as shaliach, or agency, where God can be said to be doing something when in reality, God is doing it by or through his agent. According to the IVP Bible background commentary on the New Testament, Jewish law taught that the man's agent was as a man himself, backed by his full authority, to the extent that the agent faithfully represented him. Moses and the Old Testament prophets were sometimes viewed as God's agents. But, of course, unlike all of them, Jesus was the uniquely begotten, perfect agent of God. After all, the messianic prophecies referred to him as the firstborn high above the kings of the earth in Psalm 89, 27. So, to summarize, point number one, for Paul, God is the Father, just as in the rest of the New Testament. These are matters of undeniable fact. 
Point number two for Paul, Jesus is the human son of God and not God the son. Paul repeatedly contrasts the son with the first human, Adam, who was created and died. And we know that God cannot do either of these things. Point three for Paul, Jesus is not even called God. Many notable Trinitarian scholars have admitted over the centuries that all verses where Paul seems to call Jesus God contain grammatical errors or corruption to the text. And lastly, for Paul, Jesus is the Lord Messiah, not the Lord God. Paul time and again contrasts the one Lord God, that is the Father, with his human son, the Lord Messiah, Christ Jesus. Paul's understanding was educated by one of the most used Old Testament verses, Psalm 110, verse 1. The Hebrew and Greek carefully distinguish between the first Yahweh or Jehovah Lord and the second Lord Adoni, again a word never used for God. Paul could, Paul could apply so-called Yahweh text to Jesus because he full well understood Jesus to be the promised Messiah, the prophet from Deuteronomy 18, that is God supreme, unique, and only perfect agent. As Paul puts it, in 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ, not that God was Christ. For Paul, the Father will always be the God of the Son, so that, as Paul says, with one mind, in one voice, you Christians all over the world may glorify the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Also see 2 Corinthians 1, Colossians 1, and Ephesians chapter 1. Thank you. All right, well, uh, Carlos finished a little over a minute early, um, so as opposed to Anthony, who rudely uses extra time. Um, uh, all right, Anthony, are you ready for your first rebuttal? And for everyone who's just tuning in now, we are in the middle of a debate on the topic, did Paul teach that Jesus is God? Um, our participants have given their opening statements, Anthony Rogers on the affirmative, Carlos Xavier on the negative. We just finished up the opening statements. We're now going to go into our first round of rebuttals before going on to uh, the cross-examination. So you all set, Anthony? Uh, turn your microphone on, Anthony. <laughs> yeah, that will help. First he tells me to turn it off, <laughs> then he tells me to turn oh, it off. Oh, you, you are still breaking up some there. Um, um, not, but, no, I'm just saying that so that people don't try to inform me that you're breaking up. Um, that just happens. We've we've been doing this for a couple of years now, live streams, and sometimes in an area you just got uh, internet connection uh, issues if a bunch of people are going online and watching YouTube because they're, it's Friday and they just got off work and stuff like that. Uh, this Matter of fact, if I recall correctly, Friday is when this happened most frequently in the past um, to have internet problems. But it's just good to know that it's on your end and not on my end because if we're on my end, then I would be I would be trying to figure out what I could do about it later, but that means you'll have to do it. So anyway, uh, Anthony's having a slight uh, internet connectivity problem on his end. Basically, he goes for a while, and then we'll start searing a little bit garbled, but that's just life, so we got to roll with it. We're in the middle of a debate here. All right, so Anthony, you ready to go ahead and get started? I am. You want me to go? Uh, yep, whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, Carlos's first argument in his opening presentation is that God is the Father, according to Paul. Of course, that's not something I disagree with, but Carlos, of course, means something more than that. He says that God for Paul is only the Father, something I don't think Carlos can prove, and I don't think that he did prove. He cites 1 Corinthians 1.3 uh, as an example of this, because it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What he fails to notice or draw attention to, or at least sufficiently appreciate, is that Paul not only refers to the Father as God, an Old Testament title for deity, but to Jesus as Lord, another divine title. Now, Carlos, of course, wants to water down the implications or significance of that title to mean merely that Jesus is some kind of human Lord and not the divine 
I'll have various answers as I go through my uh, response, but notice in 1 Corinthians 1.3, we already have clear evidence of that. When Paul says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, notice that he says these two divine blessings, these saving blessings, grace and peace, come to us alike from Father and Son, God and Lord. And, and notice, it's not that simply that uh, grace and peace come to us from the Father through the Son, Paul conjoins both and speaks of both alike as the source of that saving grace and peace that comes to believers. Clearly, Paul is not referring to Jesus as Lord here in any sense less than its full significance as found in the Old Testament, where it refers to deity. Indeed, even in the verse right before this, Paul speaks of calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus, another indication that he's using the term Lord here in the sense of Yahweh. That's how it's used throughout the Old Testament, call upon upon the name. This is also the chapter where Paul goes on to apply a Yahweh text to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 131, when he says that we're to boast only in the Lord, the Lord Jesus, a quotation of the Old Testament, where Lord there refers to Yahweh. He says that uh, the idea of the deity of Jesus is inherently un-Jewish. He quoted somebody uh, to that effect, but as I pointed out, Scholarship today has moved in completely the opposite direction, most significantly Jewish scholarship. I quoted Jewish scholars like Daniel Boyerin, an Orthodox Jew, a Talmudic scholar, referring not to post-Christian Judaism, which is really uh, what the scholars that he's quoting are referring to. They're looking at post-Christian Jews and anachronistically reading their uh, suppression of earlier Judea Judaism back into the first century. But as Daniel Boyerin and Neusner both point out, ancient Jews believed in the pluritarian or multi-personal nature of God and in the deity of the coming Messiah. I'll be interested here response that I gave uh, when he comes to his rebuttal. He also said that God is one person. Here he quotes Galatians 3.20, spe uh, specifically in the Amplified Version, by the way, which I find somewhat laughable. First of all, I think the Amplified Version is uh, a mess. It leaves uh, room for people to pick any term they want uh, to plug in, and so it really isn't uh, proving anything. Uh, but more than that, I mean, the updated version of the Amplified drops the phrase God is one person because that's not there in the Greek text. It does not say God is one person. Uh, in fact, uh, that's not even the point that Paul is making. Paul is referring to mediation there, not identification. But moreover, in connection with this, Carlos said that the Greek word heis, for one, God is one, in Galatians 3.20, uh, uh, always means one person. False. That's complete uh, nonsense. In Galatians 3.28, Paul says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Clearly, we are not one person in Christ Jesus. Uh, he goes on to say that Jesus is the uh, human son, according to Paul. He quotes Romans 5 here, where the son is the second Adam. But Paul is not saying that Jesus is is the son by virtue of being the second Adam. That's completely uh, turning things on its head. Paul, at the very beginning of the book of Romans, as I already quoted in my opening, in Romans 1-3, speaks of Christ as the son becoming a man. It's, he says the son became a man or was made a descendant of David according to the flesh. So yes, Jesus is a man, but Jesus became a man, and he didn't by virtue of becoming a man become the son. He also refers to Galatians 4.4, where it says he was made of a woman, another passage I cited. But notice how the passage starts. It doesn't say that he was made of a woman, and that's when he became the son. It says that in the fullness of time, God sent the son. It is, is really strong here. Ex It means to send out from himself. He sent out from himself the son who was made of a woman, made under the law. Just two verses later, he says the same thing of the Holy Spirit. He says God sent out or sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That doesn't mean the spirit became or came into existence once he was in our hearts. It, uh, the, it clearly refers to the fact that the spirit existed prior to being sent forth into our hearts. Uh, he quoted Romans 15, same kind of reasoning where it speaks of Christ as the second Adam. Here it's referring to the fact that Christ now bearing our nature has come to fulfill as a man what Adam failed to do. He's not saying that Jesus became the son by virtue of becoming a human being. Ditto for passages like Romans uh, 5.10. Well, here he says that uh, Jesus died and clearly he can't be God because of that. 
Uh, but that just completely misses the incarnation. Obviously, God is God, cannot die. The Son became or was made a human being. He was made a descendant of David. He was made of a woman. And because of that, he could die. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, the very opposite of what Carlos said. Paul says there, if they had known, they would not have crucified, killed the Lord of glory, a title that clearly identifies Jesus as Yahweh. In fact, it comes from Psalm 24, where the Lord or King of glory is Yahweh. The very first verse of that psalm, where it says the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, is applied to Jesus as well in 1 Corinthians 10. So none of these arguments that Carlos is making come within a mile or even a million miles of refuting the true deity of Jesus Christ. Third, he said Jesus is not called God uh, by Paul. Now here I want people to notice several things. In the first place, my primary argument for the deity of Christ and that he's called by name, which is, in fact, I think a lot more significant than simply the use of the title God. Yahweh is God's distinctive name, his covenant name, the name that the Jews referred to as the Shem HaMathoresh, the distinctive name, and the Shem HaMayahud, the unique name, this name that belongs to God alone. Jesus, being called Yahweh, cuts through all the... Uh, it, uh, worthless arguments that God can be used in all kinds of different senses. Yahweh is used for the true God alone, and Jesus is identified as Yahweh throughout the, the New Testament, throughout the writings of Paul. But here he says Jesus is not called God. That word isn't used for him. What he's trying to do is refute passages I didn't even bring up, which I find somewhat humorous because it gives me an opportunity to, to appeal to them. In Romans 9.5, Paul says that Christ is from Israel according to the flesh— and then he goes on to say, he is God over all forever praised. Of course, there's a textual problem here, but Carlos said that this is one of those passages uh, where there, you know, uh, uh, textual issues abound. No, there's no textual problem here. Uh, the text is firm. What people dispute is the translation. I maintain the uh, standard translation. Christ is God over all, who's forever praised. It's consistent with the context. It's consistent with the fact that Paul says that according to the flesh, He's descended from Israel, which leaves, uh, you know, opens the question, well, in what sense is he not uh, uh, from Israel? Why does he say according to the flesh? Well, the answer is, as the verse goes on to say, he's God over all. Uh, but again, I didn't appeal to that passage. I also didn't appeal to Titus 2.13, uh, where, uh, you know, the, the translation, all standard, uh, you know, there, there might, people still want to argue these points. Uh, but the standard view is that that's a classic TSKS construction in Greek. You have two nouns joined by the Greek word chi, only the first of which is preceded by the, the definite article, which means first to one I'm referring to in Titus 2.13 is the statement uh, you know, uh, that we're waiting for the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. These are two passages I do believe Paul applies to Jesus, but those aren't uh, passages I appeal to in my opening statement. Those are passages Carlos apparently has uh, you know, a guilty conscience on and, and feels he needs to deal with. Uh, you know, and, and for whatever you know uh, reason, he spent most of his time here attacking uh, the uh, you know the, the scriptures, talking about their corruption. Uh, I do agree that there are uh, copyist errors, but this is all taken care of uh, by comparing and collating manuscripts through the science of textual criticism. I don't believe we've lost the text of scripture. We can't know what the text of scripture is. But if I were a rationalistic Unitarian, I'd certainly want to charge the scriptures with corruptions because they call Christ God. Uh, you know, he mentioned Isaac Newton, the greatest scientist, uh, you know, mentioning these things. Well, apparently he was a great scientist, but not a great exeter. Uh, he mentioned 1 Timothy 1.17, where it says God can't die. I quite agree, God can't die, but assume God took on a human nature. Could he die then? Absolutely. Could death keep its hold on him? Absolutely not. And that's what the scriptures teach concerning Christ. Uh, and that's what Paul taught concerning Christ. Uh, he said that Jesus is the Lord Messiah, and he, and he bases this on Psalm 110. I agree Jesus is the Lord Messiah, but that doesn't mean, you know, a human Lord Messiah. Uh, he said Psalm 110 is the key controlling definitional verse for Paul. Uh, and, and he said that the word for Lord there in the second instance is Adonai and never refers to a divine person. That is, Yahweh said to my Adonai. He's simply wrong. First of all, the Hebrew word is Adon. 
the, the word e at the end, the yod, is simply a first person uh, suffix meaning my. So the name there is Adon, and it's used for God at least 30 times in the Old Testament. Even if you want to restrict yourself, uh, if, if we want to restrict ourselves to the uses of the it's a term used for God. One Joshua minute. 5, he uses it for the Sar Sava Yahweh, the captain of the Lord's host, whom is the same person that appeared to Moses in Exodus 3, who said the place on which you're standing is holy ground. This is clear from the fact that uh, Joshua 6, 2, he refers to him as Yahweh and Adoni. There are also Israelite names that use the word Adoni in reference to Yahweh. Second Samuel 3, 4, there's Adonijah, Adoni, Yah, meaning Adoni is my Yah, my uh, Yahweh. Uh, worst of all, the one called Adoni in Psalm 110.1 is called Adonai in Psalm 110.5, an exclusive title for deity. The same person at Yahweh's right hand in Psalm 110.1 uh, and referred to as Adoni is referred to as Adonai in Psalm 110.5. He said this is the controlling text and, and the, uh, the text through which we should interpret Paul. Okay, let's do so. If, if the psalmist says that uh, the one at Yahweh's right hand is Adonai 110.5, then he's a divine person, and there should read Paul, and I'll conclude with that. All right, thank you, Anthony. You once again went f this time four seconds over, so you're still going over, but uh, you're getting better. You're, in the, you're heading in the right direction. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Carlos, you got your mic turned back on? Yes, sir. Um... Let me get my watch. Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yep. I hear you. Okay. Um, let me get you up on the screen here. Uh, this is 15 minutes, we said? Uh, 12 minutes, although you can go, 12? although Sorry. you have a total of, uh, you have about 22 seconds that you can go over because that's about the total <laughs> that Anthony has gone uh, no over. Problem. So anytime you're ready, I will start the clock. All right. Thank you, Anthony Rogers for that. Uh, so I'm rebutting his opening here, and then I'll rebut what he just said for the viewer. Uh, might get a bit confusing. I haven't done two rebuttals. Okay, so first of all, I thought the debate uh, question is, did Paul teach Jesus is God, not does the Old Testament teach the Trinity? I think uh, Roger, uh, Anthony um, spent more than half his opening in trying to prove that the Trinity is found in the Old Testament. Now, you have to ask yourselves one simple question, and hopefully I'll ask this in the cross-exam, but the implication that the Jews from the very beginning, it sounds like, and I hope Anthony can correct me if, if I'm misunderstanding him, but to imply or say, I think he's flat out saying that the Jews from the beginning, the Israelites, the ancient Hebrews were Trinitarians. I'm not sure if that's uh, what he is actually stating, not even implying here. Well, that is just not true. Uh, they were not Trinitarians then. They were not Trinitarians during the apostolic times. And they're definitely the, the practicing Jews are not Trinitarians today. Uh, he in his opening, he brought up three caveats, which I found very interesting reason as a tool. He mentioned, let's use reason as a tool and that biblical Unitarians reject uh, rationalism, rational thinking. Now, like I said in my opening, I call myself a Christian Unitarian, not a biblical Unitarian. But be that as it may, actually, what happened to the earliest uh, biblical Unitarians is that many of them w uh, went rationalist. They became rationalist and um some of them form what is now known as the Universalist Unitarian uh, group. Uh, I'm obvi obviously not that. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Messiah and Savior and so on. So I'm not a rationalist. I just want to make that clear because you might see that in the literature if you see the history. Uh, he quoted from my uh, father-in-law's uh, book, The Doctrine of the Trinity, which I highly recommend. So thanks for the plug. Uh, please get that book by uh, uh, Hunting and Buzzard, The Doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, he quoted him as saying that the Trinity is an incomprehensible mystery. And that, and I, I believe he agrees with that quote. And I agree as well that uh, the Trinity 
Uh, sorry, uh, I'm not saying you agreed with that. We we see the Trinity as an incomprehensible mystery because that's why many of your fellow apologists say, Anthony, uh, there is the famous ancient saying that if uh, if you try to understand it, understand it, you'll go mad. But if you reject it, you will lose your salvation. That's a well-known ancient saying. So it... <laughs> We're just going by what many of your fellow apologists have uh, portrayed your own doctrine to be an incomprehensible mystery. And to this day, many uh, famous uh, evangelists, uh, preachers, call it a mystery, although some of them, uh, very few of them, go on to teach it in their churches. I wish ac actually the doctrine of the Trinity would be taught more in, in churches so people can make up their minds by themselves Yes, truth is deposited in the Messiah. But what truth are we talking about here? A truth of a multi-personal God? Or the truth, as I stated, that for Paul, only the Father is the, the only true God. Um, uh, Anthony brought up Colossians 2.9. The deity, uh, the fullness of deity dwells bodily in the, or in the body of the Messiah. Yes, I believe that. Uh, I quoted from 2 Corinthians, uh, I believe it was 5. Paul says God was in Christ. That's an odd thing to say, by the way, if Paul believed that the Messiah was also the same God. Again, we go back to the incomprehensible uh, unreasonableness of the doctrine of the Trinity. Colossians 2.9, by the way, you can compare it with uh, other texts like Ephesians 3.19, where it says that we Christians are supposed to have that same fullness, pleroma, of Theos, of God, of deity, of, of, of God himself, Ephesians 3.19. I'll just bring it up here. So that you, says Paul to the Christians, may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, of deity. It's the same thing. So are we somehow part of this uh, multi-personal Godhead? Obviously not. We are in a spiritual sense, if you want to talk about that, Jesus obviously in uh, the Gospel of John talks about all of us being one with the Father and the Son through the Spirit. Um, he brought up 1 Timothy 2.5, uh, which he seems to agree on, but it sounds like he's reading there that there is one God and there is one mediator, and that's the Christ Jesus himself human, some translations have in 1 Timothy 2.5. But then, uh, Anthony, if you noted, it, throw, threw in what sounded like the so-called double nature. That it doesn't mean he's just human. It also means he's God. I mean, that's an addition to the text. Uh, the so-called double nature or hypostatic union, as it's called, is nowhere taught in Scripture. Jesus is one person, one being, one self, one individual. Nowhere is it taught he had two natures uh, or, or, or anything even remotely close to it. He talks about Deuteronomy 6.4, the famous Shema that Paul quotes or alludes to in 1 Corinthians 8.6. And he said that there it's, it's supposed to be a unity of persons, not about uh, not nothing, I think he said. Quote, nothing. That's not what I believe. I believe that the Shema, like Jesus, is describing one singular self, one individual, who he calls time and again the Father, uh, as the only God, as the Ehad, the one Lord, the one Yahweh. Uh, so you can, again, go back to my first point, where I made the very clear teaching from Paul that Paul believed God to be the father of the Shema. That's not nothing. That is someone. Uh, he brought up Genesis 1.26. I've heard of uh, do this a lot. And Genesis 19.24, Yahweh from Yahweh and so on. But again, this is a debate about whether or not Paul taught that Jesus is God, not whether the Old Testament teaches the Trinity. Be that as it may, you'll find, by the way, in modern scholarship, that the let us, the so-called let us argument of Genesis 126, most reputable as far as I know, scholars have 
have done away with that. They cannot defend that any longer. And same with the so-called Yahweh rain fire down from Yahweh from heaven. They don't use that anymore. Um, let's see, Jews. So again, were Jews Trinitarians? So Paul was a Trinitarian, and that's a question uh, I hope to get to. Uh, he brought up uh, Jewish scholar Neusner, Yaakov, I believe it's Yaakov Neusner. Uh, yes, there are many, uh, I'm sure there are many more Jewish scholars today that, that teach some form of a multi-personal Yahweh or Jehovah. But this is uh, nothing uh, unusual. In Judaism, in ancient Judaism, you had a, uh, a many Jews who believed in the so-called two powers in heaven. Uh, you have the Kabbalah, the Jewish mysticism, where they, they taught very similar things to what became Trinitarianism, by the way. But these are obviously known as heretical systems within Judaism. So I'm sure there are some Jewish scholars today that still hold to some kind of multipersonal or try to to read in the Old Testament a multi-personal uh, Jehovah Yahweh. He talked about the Book of Acts and uh, where Paul there the uh, Damascus I believe on the road to Damascus. He was his conversion story, and he talked about who Paul talked to or or saw, or he thought he saw. And actually, it's interesting because. In the same book in Acts, we have the famous story of Stephen, the mar who's martyred, who's killed by his own people for preaching Jesus as the Messiah, by the way. Um, and Stephen, as, as Anthony noted, also saw someone in, in heaven at the right hand of God. And he said, the son of man. Stephen saw a human being at the right hand of God, not another Jehovah, not another God but a human being at the right hand of the majesty. And again, I, I went through my opening about the Yahweh texts applied to Jesus, and that's where uh, Anthony finally uh, went back to the debate question, and I appreciate that. Yahweh texts, as I said, are very uh, understandable in light of Psalm 110, verse 1. There are not two Yahwehs there. There are not two Adonais or two Jehovahs there, which would be two gods. That's not something, obviously, Trinitarians say, but it sounds like they're very comfortable in, in talking about two Yahwehs now. So I'm going to ask Anthony about that. Is Jesus a second Yahweh, which would mean a second God, clearly? So you have uh, Romans 14, he brought up, Philippians 2, every knee will bow. Uh, yes, every knee will bow to the man Acts 17, 31, to the man God, the one God has appointed to judge. This is uh, throughout the Hebrew scriptures, where God picks someone, an agent, either an angelic, non-human agent, or a human, one minute. and, and calls, calls them saviors and lords and so on, so they can bring judgment upon Israel. The, the uh, prophets at many times play the role of, of judge, bringing judgment down on, on the rebellious Israel, calling on the name of the Lord. Again, we call, and I, I agree, I call on the name of the Lord. I pray to Jesus, but not as the Lord God. I pray to him as who Paul prayed to him as, the Messiah, which means the anointed one of the one Jehovah God, not a second Jehovah or a second God. And I never said, uh, actually, I'll get to this in the second rebuttal, uh, the word is in Greek, uh, which means one. Thank you. All right. Uh, once again, Carlos did not go over. So <laughs> Anthony is the only one without manners here. Uh, Anthony, you want to turn your audio on if you turned it off during that? Okay, it's on. Uh, Carlos, you should turn your camera back on because this is, I believe, the, uh, uh, the cross-examination. So affirmative goes first. So uh, uh, sorry, It's the second rebuttal. Uh, on, on what you sent me, it says opening st statements, 20 minutes, first round of rebuttals, 12 minutes, cross-examinations, 10 minutes, then second round of rebuttals at oh, eight okay. minutes. Does that work? Yeah, sure. Okay, so am I to understand correctly that when it says affirmative cross-examinations, that would be Anthony asking questions and Carlos answering them, and then we switch? 
Yes. That's correct. Okay, so this will be for uh, a period of 10 minutes, everyone. So just so in case uh, anyone uh, missed, missed the format at the beginning, this is the cross-examination period. So uh, we'll have two periods of 10 minutes for this first round of 10 minutes. Uh, Anthony will be asking questions and Carlos will be answering questions and then we'll flip it and Carlos will be asking questions to Anthony. Anthony will be um, answering those questions. So uh, let me get Anthony up on the screen here. And all right. And just so everyone knows, some weird stuff can happen uh, with all these Skype things. Sometimes uh, it starts, uh, they start switching on the screen. They hasn't done that so far. But um, all right, are you gentlemen both ready? All right, right. An Anthony, I will start the clock when you ask your first question. Okay, Carlos, you brought up several times Psalm 110, an Old Testament text, by the way, which I found surprising because you criticized me for focusing a lot on the Old Testament. But I agree with you that the Old Testament's relevant. It establishes Paul's Christian Jewish uh, background. Uh, but you said that Psalm 110 is the lens through which we should interpret the Apostle Paul. That's why I spent so much time on the Old Testament. Uh, in Psalm 110.1, you said that Yahweh speaks to a human Lord. Adonai, it always means a human Lord. Uh, what do you say in response to the fact that the, the word is Adon, and the E is simply a suffix added on to the end? And Adon is used for God in the Old Testament. You're, you're smirking. Do you, do you have an answer to that, or can uh, you not hear no, me? No, sorry, I was trying not to. Uh, you were breaking up. Uh, you, you you broke up towards the end, Anthony, if you want to repeat uh, right right after you started talking about the, the suffix. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so so the word is, the, the name is Adam. The suffix is the yod right. at the end. It just means my. So the name is Adam. Uh, can, uh, are you aware of the fact that the word is used for deity at least 30 times in the Old Testament? For example, uh, Joshua 3.11. Right, if you mean for angels, yes, it's used for angels no, and humans. No, 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 Adon, I'm talking about Adon, the, the Hebrew name Adon, not not right. with the suffix. For, just for a second, I'm asking you about the name Adon. Are you familiar well, with the fact that it is used for God? Right, well, I'm just reading the the Hebrew with the vowel points. You're not, it sounds like. So I'm relying well, on the vowel well, points. N no, I mean, I don't have to rely on the vowel points, but the, the vowel points, even if we're... Oh, you're cutting out, sir. Pause, pause. Uh, repeat, repeat that, Anthony. Right. You broke up, Anthony. Go ahead. Well, uh, the, the Masoretes added the vowel pointings long after the Old Testament was written, but that's not my point. My point is, even if you take the Masoretic vowel pointings, uh, the word is Adon. It has the suffix e at the end, which just means my. So the word, the name that's being used there is Adon. That's what's the, the one at Yahweh's right hand is being called, Adon, specifically Adoni, my Lord. Okay, my point is the word Adon is used for God at least 30 times. Are you aware of that? Yes, of course. Adon is, is a generic term for both oh, God and humans, yes. Okay, so if it can be used for God, how would you say, how would you refer to Adon, Lord, in reference to God, and say, and personalize it, say, my Lord? How would you say that in Hebrew? Ladoni. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. The word that's used for the Messiah at the right hand of Yahweh. Now, uh, but let's one, 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 one sec Adonai, one, one second, which, Anthony. St start that. Start that part over. Uh, I said it, exactly. He said it's Ladoni. That's what, how you would call yeah. Yahweh or uh, the Lord, my Lord, in mm. Hebrew. No, no, and that's yeah, what, I caught, we caught that. Then you broke up when you started your next point. Okay, that's what uh, David calls Messiah. Mm. Now. Uh, my, my second question is, uh, how do you deal with the fact that Adonai itself, with the suffix, is used for Yahweh? It's used in Joshua 5 for the, the, the captain of the Lord's host, the one who appeared to Moses in the bush, who identifies himself as God. And it's also embedded in Israelite names like Adonijah, Adoniah, meaning my Lord is Yahweh. Adonai, Yahweh. Adonai is used for Yahweh. How do you account for that? You've argued the word only means a human lord or master and can't be re used for Yahweh. Right. So now we're talking about Adoni proper. Right. Yes. Right. Adoni is used. If you see it, uh, if you check any standard Hebrew lexicon and so on, you will see that Adoni, my lord, simply my lord, not Ladoni to my lord. Adoni is used for humans and angels, messengers of Yahweh, Jehovah. Wait, That's wait, clear. So you're you're saying the Lamed preposition somehow changes the meaning of the word? 
la adoni, the, the, the lamed at the beginning, that's just a preposition, too. How does that change the meaning of the word adon, meaning Lord? Right. Again, it's, uh, I'm confused because it sounds like you're reading the second Lord as Adon and not Adoni. So, uh, uh, again, obvi- again yeah. the word is Adon. The E at the end is just a suffix yeah. meaning my. It doesn't right. change the meaning of the word. But if, and I asked you, I, I even brought up instances of Adoni. Yahweh is called Adoni in Joshua 5 and 6. Joshua calls the Lord who appears to him Adoni. The, the angel. The angel is called yeah, the angel of God, yes. or, but he specifically calls him Yahweh as well. Uh, okay, now let's move on. I've also pointed okay. out that divine uh, that Israelites are are called Adoni, uh, Yah, Adoni Yah, which has Adoni in it in reference to Yahweh. But now, how do you account for the fact in Psalm one ten five that the same person at Yahweh's right hand is called Adonai? Isn't Adonai an exclusive title for deity? Yes, yeah, Psalm one ten five. Uh, let me. It's just the set same it up. Psalm. It's the same psalm. The one at Yahweh's right hand in verse 1 is called Ladoni, and he's called Adonai at verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. That word is Adonai. Right. It changes position. So it goes back to the Yahweh, the Jehovah, the Adonai. From, so the one, the Lord, Yahweh, Adonai of verse 1, is now at the right hand of the Messiah. And Wait, so you're... And that's so you're, uh, you're, saying in verse five, you're saying in verse five, it's now talking about Yahweh, not not Ladoni. It's not talking about that, the Messiah. Right. That's it goes back uh, to Jehovah or Adonai, as it does okay. in, in the previous Psalm, Psalm 109, verse 31 and other Psalms like uh, I believe it's Psalm 16, verse eight, where Yahweh, Jehovah Adonai is at the right hand of us, of the supplic or the one he's empowering. So that's used throughout the Psalms, maybe four right. times, I believe, Yahweh at the right hand of someone. Okay, let's stick with this Psalm. In this Psalm, David says that Messiah is at Yahweh's right hand, Ladoni. Then he says, yeah, uh, Adonai is at your right hand. He calls him Adonai. You said now it switches positions, but notice how the rest of the context goes on. Adonai, the Lord, this is verse 5, is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the children abroad. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Is that talking about Yahweh or the Messiah? The Messiah. It goes back to the Messiah. Okay, so it's talking about the Messiah from verse as, 5 on. And some... Messiah is called Adonai. As Psalm 2 uh, clearly says that the son, the, the son there, is shattering kings and, and executing judgment on the nations and so right. on. You're making my point. Verse 5, it, it, all the pronouns refer back to the Lord in verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. No, no, not, not all he, the pronouns. I oh, yes, they do. Uh, no, I did. Look, it, look at verse 5. Yeah, the I Lord think... is at your... Listen, the Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. It's talking about the Lord, Adonai. And then it's still talking about the Lord in the next verse and in the following verse. He will lift up his head by the wayside after drinking from the brook. You've admitted that the Messiah, all back to verse 5, Messiah, in this key all control text, you've admitted that it refers to the Lord. And uh, therefore, we should interpret Paul. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord in precisely this sense, in the sense of being the Lord Adonai at Yahweh's right hand. Both of those are divine titles. Is there a question? Uh, it was just a There's reputation, a I guess. Okay. Yeah, I guess I. Uh, Quest- no que- que- questions, Anthony. Questions. I'll let you drill <laughs> me. I'll let you drill me too, Carl. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> by the way, that's what I was doing. I was thinking, okay, whatever standard Anthony is applying, I'll allow Carlos to apply the same standard. In his. All right. Uh, you got about a minute and a half of questions left, Anthony. Or statements. Oh, I, I got a, a li- uh, okay. I just want to ask one question, really. Uh, I'll, I'll do uh, not necessarily central. Well, it's relevant to the debate, but sure. more curiosity at this point. Do you believe in the doctrine of inerrancy? In, inerrancy in what way? Please define that. Well, you spent time attacking, attacking the text of Scripture. I'm almost wondering how relevant it is to even point you to passages uh, if you don't really hold the uh, Scriptures to be the infallible rule of faith and practice and that sort of thing. 
Well, there are there are corruptions or of the orthodox kind in the especially in the New Testament, and but this has been found by uh, you don't you don't think just, that that we have in our manuscripts the original readings and can uh, you know determine what the right readings are. Yes, they you can obviously. We don't believe God has preserved the text in a, in a way that we can always sift through those manuscripts uh, that contain certain scribal errors. Sure, in that way, yes, they can describe okay. how many is God and who Jesus is, what the gospel about the kingdom is, and so on. Yes, the fundamentals, the big picture stuff, yes. But as you know, and, and many textual scholars, Daniel Wallace, Bart Ehrman, even when he was a believer, uh, in his famous The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, cited many corruptions to the text by copyists or early scribes from the so-called Orthodox camp that later became Catholic and then taken up by Protestants, where they clearly tried to corrupt the text to to make Jesus well, I, God. Well, I, think this, I think the shoe's on the other foot. Uh, I think it was the heretics uh, mangling the text at points. But we can I'm, determine... I'm but you, you believe that we can determine the original reading through the manuscripts that we have and, and determine where these certain uh, scribal errors crept in and so forth. You're not an agnostic regarding the text. All right, uh, well, Anthony, your question time is over, but we'll let Carlos answer that. Thank okay. you. Well, when it comes to, when it pertains to the debate question about whether or not Jesus taught, uh, sorry, uh, Paul taught Jesus is God, yes, we can very, very clearly and easily find that out. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are going to uh, switch right now, yep. and now Carlos will be asking uh, Anthony questions, but Carlos will also, uh, for consistency, get plenty <laughs> of leeway with how he deals with his uh, his question time. All right, go ahead. Whenever you're ready, Carlos, I'll start the, I'll start the clock. <laughs> Thank you, David. Right. Uh, Anthony, however we define death, Paul says to Timothy in the text uh, we quoted, 1 Timothy 6.16, uh, that God cannot die, right? So however we define death, I know you are in a, a immortal, what's called an immortal, you hold to the immortal soul doctrine. I'm a so-called conditionalist. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use that, that so, terminology. So yeah. my question is, uh, who died then, according to Paul, in verses like Romans 5.10, where it says that the Son of God died? Who died? Right. Your question assumes a view opposite of my own, right? It's premised upon a denial of the Incarnation, that Christ has two natures. As an Orthodox Christian, I believe Christ is a divine person who took on nature, like it says in Philippians 2, and by virtue of that was able to die in and through that nature. Now, I, I do want to point out, when I mean, you mentioned passages like 1 Timothy 1 or 1 Timothy 6, and it refers to God as immortal, the word for immortal, uh, I would argue, pertains to the body it always refers to the the body which uh, is is has immortality bestowed upon it, right? It's it's a, a in other words, it doesn't pertain to the soul. I do believe man's soul exists after death, but the term for immortality refers to what's conferred on the body at the resurrection. First Corinthians fifteen. You agree with that? Well, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, what are you doing, Anthony? Come on. Hey, sorry. Uh, Follow-up question. So just just to be clear for our audience, do you believe, this, like Paul, that the Son of God died in Romans 5.10? Do you believe that? Absolutely. Yeah, he died for us men and for our salvation. Okay. There, I had, uh, I had to sneak in a creed real quick. Uh, next question in uh, about Philippians 2. So Philippians 2, just for the sake of the audience, Paul says that we should have the attitude that was in Christ, who existed in the form of God, right? And uh, he chose instead to be like a bond servant or a slave, right? By emptying himself, that's Philippians 2, 7. What did the Christ, what did the Messiah empty himself of? Well, it, it defines it. Actually, there's there's a, a lot of confusion and uh, there, debate stems from this where people ask that very question. They're just not paying attention to the grammar. It might seem strange to us, but the way uh, Christ emptied himself, according to Paul, is not by getting rid of something, but by taking on something. In verse 7, it says he em emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So this self-emptying uh, was done by virtue of taking on himself a human nature and appear a man uh, and not uh, as he is in his essential nature prior to that uh, as also in the form of God. 
Um, do you believe or do you hold to the translation uh, regarding the the morphe, the morphe there, the in the form of God, the word morphe, which means form? Uh, do you also uh, agree with translations like the NIV that it can be translated in very nature God? I, I think that's a very viable uh, interpretation viable? of that. So, but it's not it's not uh, required for the incarnational understanding. Okay. Right. It was held by B.B. Warfield and others, but it's not the only one consistent okay. with a, a but, incarnational reading. But it is a possible translation that you would accept in very nature, more faith. Sure, because it also okay. says that he took upon him the form of a servant uh, and in uh, addition to that. And I take that to mean, as Paul explains it here, uh, appearing in the likeness of man. Right, so it need, it, it does mean the very nature it, later in the context. So I would think consistency requires so he was, understanding. So he was b by nature God and by nature a bond servant or a slave. That's two natures. He be, he be, yes, he became. Well, he be, uh, he took upon himself, or uh, it says there he take uh, by so, taking the form of a servant and right. being made in the likeness of men, being so found he, in appearance as a man, and so forth. Right. So if we're consistent with Morphe as nature, so he had two natures. A uh, God Amen. nature and a bond servant nat nature, like a slave. And and, and the bond servant natures. nature is further defined as the likeness of man. Okay. Uh, he was like us in all respects without sin. All right, thank you. In keeping with Philippians 2, it goes on to say that for this reason, for, for all the reasons stated, God, in verse 9, has the Greek there, as you probably know, is super exalted the Christ, right? Super exalted. So how my question how can God super exalt someone who by very nature is also God? Yeah, it, it's funny because uh, Paul makes the, uses the same sort of reasoning, but he comes to an opposite conclusion. In Ephesians 4, Paul speaks of Christ ascending. But then he asks the question, how could he ascend unless he first descended? It presupposes a prior descent. And the reason it does is because he's a divine person. A divine person can't ascend unless he, unless he first descends. The reason that Christ could be hyper-exalted is precisely because, existing in the form of God, he took on the form of a bondservant and humbled himself even to the point of death, the death of the cross. So now, in our nature, he is exalted up to the right hand of the Father, where he now represents us. So he's not exalted in his divine nature? Uh, so, he, is, he is exalted as the incarnate God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul even right. calls him Lord there, and he applies a Yahweh text to him, Isaiah so, 45, 23. So the, so the one God super exalts uh, God the, the incarnate Son, Lord Jesus, right? Amen. In both yes. natures, so he's exalting the divine and human nature? He's super exalting exalted. the divine person who is incarnate, and by virtue of that incarnation was okay. uh, humbled. He self-humbled. Uh, if Jesus is the creator God as you believe, why does Paul uh, use the prepositions through dia, Christ, in like 1 Corinthians 8, 6, right? For us Christians, there is one God the Father, one Lord, Messiah Jesus, through whom, right? So if, if Jesus is the creator, why does Paul use those prepositions dia? And then also in Colossians 1, 16, Paul says all things were created. As you know, that's a, what's called a divine passive. In other words, someone else created through uh, the Christ, Jesus. So how, how do you explain that? Uh, are you, if, wait, are you, you're, are you you're arguing that Dia can't, are you, are you asking if Dia is used for Jesus? And if so, how could he be God if, if that's the case? Right, if Jesus is the creator in the absolute sense of the word, why would Paul use prepositions of uh, what some call um, instrumental agency, like dia, through? And the divine passive in Colossians 1.16, all things were created by someone else, dia, through Jesus. Why? Okay, well, first of all, uh, the same uh, words are used for creation by the Father. Romans 11.36 says, that, for That's of not him my and question. That's not my well, question. Well, it's, it's, it's my answer. Uh, from him and through him, it uses the word dia, the very word you said shouldn't be used of Jesus if he's the creator. All things are from him and through him and to him. Paul uses that very preposition of Jesus 
use of the Father, Romans 36. That is an answer to your question. As far as the passive in Colossians, I don't take it the way you do. The Father's not in view in Colossians 1, so it's not talking about things being created through by the Father There's through the Son there. There's a divine passive in Colossians 1.16. All things were created. That's a there, divine passive. Why would there, Paul there, there, use those types of... There's no such thing as a, a divine passive. We, we can interpret certain phenomena as a divine passive, but that's not a Greek rule. It, it's not something that's... It, it is a Greek it, rule. It's called the divine it's, passive. That's what that's what people label something. Uh, but I'm telling you that in Colossians one, it's it, there's no discussion there of Paul uh, of of God the Father creating things through the Son. The Father is not in view in Colossians one. Okay, so to say um, that next next question, why okay. does why does Paul say God was in Christ instead of simply God was Christ? Uh, sorry, God uh, was Christ or is Christ? Uh, First of all, I do think repeatedly calls Christ uh, God and Lord, especially Lord, which is the divine name Yahweh. Uh, so that is found in Scripture. As for those statements where it talks about God being in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, that only refers to the fact that the Father is actively involved in what Christ is doing. I don't deny that. The persons of the Trinity are one and work in concert. What well, the Paul, Father, I'm, I'm alluding to 2 Corinthians 5.19. Paul says God, God not is the in Christ. Father, God, he doesn't say Father, Pater, Theos, was in Christ. Why not just God was Theos? There's no father. Paul, Paul often uses the, the word God for the Father, oh, and I, his, agree. I don't. I, agree. I don't deny that. Um, I don't deny that. But, sorry, uh, my but, my time is uh, upon oh, me. Okay. Just one one last question. Why does Paul use latrevo, sacred or divine service, only for God? Second Timothy one, Romans one, Romans nine, Romans twelve. And never for Jesus. Why, if Jesus is God, does Paul on, only use latrevo, divine service, sacred service, for God alone and never Jesus? All right. Uh, well, first uh, of all, uh, uh, Anthony, uh, uh, once you answer that, then this is uh, this rounds up. All right. First of all, I don't think that Paul limits it to the Father. In Romans 1, it's talking about giving glory to God, God the Creator. The passages we just looked at show that Christ himself is Creator. Colossians 1, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Uh, everything is made uh, in him and through him and for him, Paul says. Same prepositions used for the Father. Uh, so when it talks about creation owing worship to God, and that includes the Son as well as the Spirit, if we were having that debate as well. Uh, so I don't think it's restricted to the Father. But besides that, we don't only determine worship by virtue of the use of a word. It involves actions like prayer. You've admitted that you pray to Jesus. I think you're an idolater because you think he's a mere man. Uh, or a man upon whom all sorts of honors are conferred. Still, he's a man. He's a creature. You pray to him. That's idolatry. That's Revo. That belongs to God alone. All right. Uh, thank you, Anthony. And uh, thank you guys for that round of cross-examination. Uh, according to the schedule here, um, things are going to be, uh, we're going to be picking up the pace here because we have our second round of rebuttals, eight minutes for each participant. And then we'll have our concluding statements followed by some Q&A from those of you in the chat. So if you've, uh, if any questions have been jumping into your mind, um, along the way, uh, we'll be able to start those here very shortly. So, Anthony, are you ready to go into your eight-minute rebuttal? Yes. All right. All right. Go ahead. Uh, in my opening presentation, I gave several caveats. It seems Carlos misunderstood one of them and ignored uh, the others. He misunderstood my point about rationalism. I argue that reason should be used to interpret and understand Scripture, but man's mind has limits. We shouldn't know everything it says. I mean, we can apprehend it and believe it, but to think we can plumb the depths of God's revelation about his infinite and inexhaustible nature is just foolhardy. But that's the very thing that Carlos' father-in-law does when he says that he, we, don't, we shouldn't accept something like the Trinity or deity of Christ because those are incomprehensible mysteries. Carlos actually reasoned like that. He repeatedly said, yeah, that's incomprehensible to us. I'm not saying that it's not incomprehensible, that it doesn't go beyond our full ability to, uh, uh, you know, just wrap our minds all together around, but it's a revealed truth, and as such, we're supposed to believe it if we're believers. If we believe all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are deposited in Christ. If they are, then those things that are incomprehensible to us are not incomprehensible to him, and therefore we can know that these things are rational, even if we can't fully rationalize them to ourselves. So I do think my charge stands 
uh, Socinians, Unitarians are rationalists. They reject what's not comprehensible to them. In this case, I mean, it's what God has revealed and is therefore uh, an obligation if somebody wants to call themselves a Christian. Now, I also think you didn't pay sufficient attention to why I dwelt on the Old Testament, something you did as well, by the way, so I'm not sure why it was a point of criticism. I pointed out that at your father-in-law, Anthony Buzzard, said in order to determine the teaching of Paul, we have to be familiar with his Old Testament background. Over and over again, I hear Unitarians saying, Paul couldn't mean that because Paul was a Jew. The Shema says there's only one person. It doesn't say one person is God. Uh, so we have to discuss these sorts of things. And my point is the Old Testament has copious evidence of divine plurality, copious evidence that a divine person, one of those divine persons, would become a human being, would be the Messiah. And so that is the background of Paul's Jewish monotheism. The, uh, nothing was said then to refute these things uh, other than uh, a little response. Uh, you know, you said something about Genesis 126. <laughs> I care. Bring him here. I'll, have, I'll be happy to debate them as well. Genesis 126 says, let us create man. It's a plural. It involves the act of creation. Only God can create. If there's a plurality being exhorted here to join him in the work, something has to be said by way of refutation, especially if you're a Unitarian and want to appeal to the Old Testament in order through it to interpret the writings of the Apostle Paul. Same thing goes for all the other passages I mentioned. I think you also misunderstood me when I quoted Jewish scholars regarding the pluritarian nature of God, that God is multipersonal. You said, uh, you know, uh, well, it's not surprising that Jews, you'd find some Jews saying this sort of thing. Uh, Jacob Neusner is not arguing that it's true. Jacob Neusner is a post-Christian Unitarian Jew who is hostile towards Christianity, and he says, yes, when you look back at early Judaism, this was what the Jews believed. It was a part and parcel of their belief, and it flows right into Christianity was not with ancient Judaism, though it is out of step with post-Christian Talmudic Judaism, which has more to do with Islam and 16th century Socinianism and biblical Unitarianism than it does first century Judaism. Uh, you said uh, you know, this sort of thing is found in the Kabbalah, uh, and, and, and this is what later becomes Trinitarianism. Poppycock, the, the Kabbalah was written way after Christianity, way, way after Trinitarianism. Uh, you admitted that there's a doctrine of two powers in heaven in ancient Judaism, but you said this is heresy. It wasn't heresy in the first century or prior to that. It was Orthodox Judaism, as pointed out by men like Daniel Boyerin. Uh, it was later a judge to heresy because post-Christian Jews didn't like how it was being used by Christians. Uh, with, with respect to Paul's conversion, you didn't seem to get my argument. Everything that happened to Paul is exactly what happened to Old Testament prophets when they were called directly by God to be a prophet. And it specifically mirrors everything by easy when God appeared to him. All of the elements are exactly the same. The verb, uh, all, you know, the language is the same. It uses the same phrases. It uses the same sentences. And they're all recorded in the exact same order. Obviously, Paul is likening his encounter of the Lord of glory with Ezekiel's encounter with the Lord of glory. It's the same person is Paul's whole point. He certainly wouldn't have, uh, you know, read it in light of later Talmudic Judaism. He'd have read it in light of uh, first century Jewish monotheism, which is, as I have argued. Uh, in response to uh, Paul's epistles, I pointed to several things. You didn't address most of them. I pointed to Old Testament Yahweh text. Here you did bring up Psalm 110, but as I think I've shown, your understanding of Psalm 10.1, through which you say we should view Paul's uh, application of Yahweh text to Jesus, I don't think your uh, view of Psalm 110.1 is at all adequate. Uh, Yahweh does speak to a divine person. He's called both Adonai and Adonai, the first of which is used for God in various places. Since it's used there for the Messiah, it means that he's God. Uh, you said nothing about all, uh, uh, the, the fact that Jesus alone is referred to as the one Lord. The very language of the Shema is used exclusively of Jesus in the New Testament, never for the Father. How, pray tell, do you believe the Father is Lord, but Jesus isn't? Seems to me you're being fundamentally inconsistent. You want to say, uh, you know, uh, if these things apply to the Father only, then you'd say, oh yeah, that's because he's Yahweh. Since they're applied to Jesus, you say they don't count. But then how do you conclude that the Father is Yahweh? He's never called Lord outside of six Yahweh texts in the New Testament, six or seven. 
uh, but you dismiss those because they're also applied to Jesus. So where, pray tell, is the Lord of the Shema in the writings of Paul if it's not Jesus? I submit to you it is Jesus, and I'd call you to faith in him as such. I also pointed out that Jesus as Lord is eternally preexistent. Colossians 1.17, he is before all things. You gave no answer to that. He sent out his son made of a woman, sent out just like he sent out the spirit into our hearts. Clearly he exists as the son prior to becoming flesh. There was no answer to those passages, no answer to the fact that he was with the Israelites in the wilderness, according to 1 Corinthians 10. No answer to the fact that Paul said he descended from heaven in order that he might ascend up into heaven. Uh, he's also the object of religious worship. Paul prays to Christ. He prays to him, in fact, in the very language that Old Testament saints prayed to Yahweh. He called upon the name of the Lord. Uh, he also offers doxologies to Christ. You didn't respond to this. That was a Jewish practice used for Yahweh alone. So I think it's very clear how Paul intends us to understand Jesus as Lord. One minute. He is the one Lord, the Lord Yahweh, the God who promised to come and save his people. He's that Lord, he's that one Lord of the Jewish Shema that all Israelites have prayed to and prayed to alone, offered doxologies to, believed was with them in the wilderness, believed appeared to the prophets and called them even tells us, I, I alluded to this before, uh, all the calling of the prophets in the Old Testament was directly by God. It was never through men or through the agency of creatures. Later, an angel might speak to one or what have you, but they're always called directly and immediately by God. Isaiah 6, Jeremiah 1, Ezekiel 3, it's always, or uh, Exodus 1, it's always directly by God. No wonder Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, sent not by man nor through men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Uh, and so I'll, I'll conclude with that. I think all the evidence points to Christ as God, the Old Testament background of Paul, Paul's encounter Time. of Jesus on the road to Damascus, and to, be, to go over once again Paul's uh, uh, use of uh, doxologies for Jesus. All right. That, that, that was nine seconds over, even after I said time. <laughs> Give it to Carlos. Just so everyone knows, that's how I think it should be done. You know, finish your sentence or whatever verse you're quoting and stuff like that. But uh, once again, I do have to... Uh, uh, Carlos now has 31 seconds extra to work with, should he want right. to, which he can use in any portion in this rebuttal or in his conclusion. Uh, let me uh, change the screen here. And... Carlos, you all set? Yes, sir. All right, whenever you're ready. All right, it's interesting. This has come down to Psalm 110.1, and the reason I quoted that Old Testament verse is because that is the New Testament verse to describe who God and Jesus are, and Paul repeatedly alludes to it. 1 Timothy 2.5, 1 Corinthians 8.6, and every time he uh, talks about the Father and the Son, obviously, at the right hand, uh, the second word there is not adon. Adon, yes, true. It's a generic term for both humans and, and God, yes. But the word there is adoni. And I know that uh, Anthony rejects the Masoretic vowel, so-called vowel points uh, of, of the Hebrew. Uh, but this is shown clearly in the Greek translation of the Old Testament by the phrase... I, I talked about Tokirio Mu that translates the Ladoni there, the to my Lord of the Hebrew and that phrase, please check it, Tokirio Mu is never used for deity, neither is Adoni, the, the word for my Lord, that's used for angelic messengers, true but God is not his own messenger and human beings, so and this is not my view. Again, please, I implore you to check any standard lexicon, Hebrew lexicon, or just talk to a rabbi. Just go to Jerusalem like I did and ask my tour guy. And, and I asked him about Adoni, what Adoni meant. And I asked him flat out, does Adoni mean Adonai? He said, no, it means my master. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.3, it's clear. Paul, throughout his letters, opens up clearly defining who is who, grace and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord, Messiah, the anointed Lord. He is not an anointed Yahweh. He, that would mean an anointed God in the absolute sense of the word. That, that, that just doesn't make sense. And we're all about using the tool of reason here, right? 
Um, he talked about Paul conjoining. I think that was a word he used, conjoining father, son as one Lord. I mean, that's, that's even worse than a uh, conjoined set of twins. There's no conjoining there. There's God the Father, the Lord God, and there's, there's the Lord Messiah Jesus, two lords. And that's clearly going back to Psalm 110, calling upon Jesus. Yes, I pray to Jesus. By the way, prayer language is not just limited to God. In Isaiah 45, 14, and I have to go to the Old Testament, Isaiah 45, 14, please check it out. The redeemed Israel will be supplicated. The word there, the Greek translation is the same as the prayer language. Israel is prayed to by the nations, Isaiah 45, 14. So there is precedent for this, but again, they call upon Israel, not because Israel is somehow deity God, but because God is with you. They go on to say the nations in Isaiah 45. Same with Jesus. Jesus is God with us, obviously in a spiritual sense, obviously in the sense of how Jesus uh, meant for us to understand when he said, if you see me, you see the Father. We're not oneness here, right? Um, the Kabbalah does predate Christianity. I, I don't know where he got this thing that Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism, this goes back all the way to the Garden of Eden some ancient scholars talked about. The so-called two powers in heaven was well known from the Babylonian captivity down. Uh, so this, these ideas within Judaism itself are there before Christianity uh, was even uh, born. I have to correct Anthony here. I did not say that the word one, the Greek is, I'm using the modern Greek translation, is by itself. I, I did not say that the word one is by itself meant one person. I'm talking about the phrase is theos or is kyrios. That is one God, one Lord. Again, please, I plead with you, if you're listening, check any standard uh, Greek lexicon on this is Kyrios means one person so when the Shema says that the Lord there Kyrios is esteen he is one the rabbi by the way agreed with Jesus in Mark 12 32 yes you're right rabbi the Lord of the Shema he is one said the rabbi um, the Granville sharp rule so there are many objections to the Granville Sharp rule by modern day Protestants. Why? Because it's a modern rule. This, this was created in the 18th century. Uh, it wasn't even around in the days of the reformers, by the way. And this was created by a person, uh, a Gran, uh, Granville here, uh, is it Char <laughs> Sorry, Sharp, who obviously was Trinitarian. And the repetition of the article, so, uh, Murray Harris, in his Jesus as God book that I mentioned, uh, says that that's, that's not a standard that should be followed. There are exceptions to this rule. And one of the big exceptions to the rule that Sharp himself said uh, should, should be avoided is the use of proper names or, or plural words. And we know that the word God, Theos, is used as a proper name by the time we get to the New Testament. And, and same with the word Kyrios, by the way, Lord. How do we know this? Because the Greek translators, 300 years before Christianity, by the way, uh, rendered the divine name, the so-called Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, which we say as Yahweh or Jehovah, they rendered it simply as Kyrios or Theos, God. So it has become a proper name. So again, that uh, so-called rule falls uh, under... Uh, the rules own exceptions. Uh, just quickly here, he talked about the word Adoni is in is in the name Adoni Yah. Uh, I forgot in which uh, uh, I think judges. Yes, the divine name is used in Elijah. For example, you have the shortened form of the so-called uh, tetragrammaton, the divine name Yah. So does that does does that mean that Elijah was somehow also part of the same uh, multi-personal God? One Obviously minute. not. And again, the Yahweh texts are applied to Jesus 
because again, Acts 1731, Paul says, God has made this man, Jesus, the judge. He is uh, God's executioner. And this is again, like I, like I read from Dr. James Dunn, a Protestant, this is uh, very well known in, in the Bible that God chooses judges. That's why they're called judges, by the way. Moses himself is seen as a judge. So they can execute judgment on behalf of God. And that goes back to the famous Shaliach agency principle that the messenger or the agent is as the principle himself. That's why Paul can loosely use so-called Yahweh texts for Jesus. Thank you. Wow, right? These are great manners. These are great manners from Carlos here. That was uh, right eight minutes on the nose. All right. Once again, though, Carlos, you have an extra 30 seconds you can work with um, in your uh, conclusion. For, for everyone who's just tuning in right now, we are having a debate. Um, Anthony Rogers versus, um, versus Carlos Xavier. And the topic is, did Paul teach that Jesus is God? We've gone through opening statements, rebuttals, cross-examination, and now we are going to have our five-minute conclusions. So we'll have a five-minute conclusion from each of our debaters, starting with Anthony. Anthony, are you ready? Uh, 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 audio, Anthony, turn on your audio. Oh, I'm ready for go. my five minute twenty second conclusion. Yeah, that's we, we know we know that's where you're going. You're gonna end up you're gonna end up you're gonna end up giving Carlos like a nine minute conclusion with all your. Uh... <laughs> he can have it. All right, Anthony. Whenever um, you're ready, you've got five. You guys put down five minutes. Five minutes. Yes. Okay. By way of conclusion, I think Carlos has fully justified my original charge that Socinians, which is the earlier term used for his movement, uh, are actually rationalists. They believe that human reason trumps uh, the text of Scripture. If God reveals something, they can dismiss what it says on the grounds that this is incomprehensible or this doesn't make sense to us. He did that numerous times. He said the Trinity is not comprehensible, uh, the idea of a two-natured Christ is incomprehensible, and the idea of God dying is incomprehensible, even though for all of these things I've given biblical evidence. He does not believe all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are different. In Christ, if you need to disagree with Christ when he reveals these things in his word. I also pointed out that uh, the Old Testament teaches this. This is Paul's Old Testament background. He never gave any real answer to that. Uh, he never gave any answer to the Old Testament evidence for the deity of the Messiah. Uh, he never adequately dealt with the fact that Second Temple Jews believed, in fact, in a multi-personal God, and that one of those persons would be the Messiah. All of this is part of Paul's Jewish background. He didn't adequately deal with the fact of Paul's conversion, where the entire uh, description of it mirrors that of the calling of the prophets by God himself. This is very clearly the case when you compare Paul's account to Ezekiel's account. As scholars admit, even Jewish scholars, Alan Siegel in his book on Paul uh, the Pharisee, uh, he admits this as do numerous other scholars. It, it's very clearly patterned after these Old Testament uh, theophany call narratives. Uh, he never adequately dealt with the fact that Old Testament Yahweh text harping on side one. But I think it should be painfully obvious to everyone, as I pointed out, that text does not support his view. He tried to renew the argument here. He doesn't seem to understand what I was saying. I wasn't rejecting the Masoretic vowel pointings, by the way, though it is relevant to point out that they were added afterwards. Uh, but the, the text calls the same person in verse 1, who called Adonai, Adoni, it calls him Adonai in verse 5. Uh, the fact that I wasn't saying that names like Adonijah mean that Ad, uh, Adonijah, the person named that, is Yahweh. The point is that his name means Adoni Yah. That's Adoni, the Lord, is my Yah. It uses the word Adoni for Yahweh, which Carlos says is never used for a divine person. It's never used for Yahweh. Well, there it is. Uh, and then there are other passages I gave for that. I don't think Carlos ever adequately dealed with my arguments for the use of Old Testament Yahweh phrases for Jesus. I mean, really, when you think about it, he, he wants to say that Jesus was just an agent, and so he can use the name works of Yahweh. That's not the biblical concept of agency, where a person can just completely confuse himself with the person who sent him. That's not the law of agency, as Carlos calls it. That's identity theft. 
unless, of course, it's true. Jesus is Yahweh. Paul calls him Yahweh repeatedly. He applies Old Testament texts to him, Old Testament stereotypical Yahweh phrases for him. He even tells us that Jesus is eternally pre-existent. Carlos didn't refute those passages. He tells us uh, that Paul, Christ is involved in creation, and he's the sustainer of the world, and he's the object of religious prayer. First Timothy 1, numerous passages. First Timothy 4.18, the doxology to Christ. All of this points to Jesus as Yahweh. None of the argumentation he's given displaces that. Uh, he did say towards the end, you know, that people will supplicate Israel. He pointed to Isaiah 45. Uh, but uh, if you look at the text, the people that are supplicating are in front of those they're talking to. The word supplication doesn't mean religious worship. They can, you can ask somebody for something who's standing in front of you. But when you start praying to someone who's not in visible presence and asking them for things that goes beyond the range of what humans can do, like Paul did for Jesus, now you're engaging in religious prayer. Carlo says he does that to Jesus, but he says Jesus is only a man. I conclude then by observing that Carlos is, for all intents and purposes, an idolater. And I plead with you, Carlos, come and embrace Jesus as the Lord of the Shema, the Lord that Paul encountered on the road to Damascus, the one that Paul identified as Lord very clearly in the sense of Yahweh, the one Lord of Israel, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And I'll conclude with that. Wow, Anthony, you just got all your time back. So that was good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if, if uh, really, if Carlos wants that extra 30 seconds, though, he can still have it because uh, you did go early. Um, I mean, you did go late earlier. All right. So, uh, Carlos, do you want this? Uh, I see you pulling up a PowerPoint. Did you want your PowerPoint yeah, up on the screen? Yeah, sorry about that. I'm just. No problem. Take your time. No problem. Take your time. I will. Uh, I've got your uh, your uh, PowerPoint up on the screen. You can. St I'll start your time whenever you're ready. Uh, give me a minute. No problem, no problem. Take your time. Okie doke. For Paul, so point number one, for Paul, God is the Father almost 100% of the time, as I, as I have shown many Trinitarian scholars have conceded this simple fact. The noted German Protestant Heinrich Meyer, or Mayer, in his New Testament commentary, says that only one, that is the Father, can absolutely be termed the only true God. Romans 9, 5, the one being over all God, not at the same time Christ. So it's self-evident that the God of the Bible is set over and against the gods of the nations. This is Paul's point in 1 Corinthians 8, that for us, that is Christians, there is only one God, the Father. Everything came or comes from God the Father, and we live because of God the Father. Uh, my point number two, for Paul, Jesus is the human son of God who was made, yenomenon, came into existence in Mary. Jesus is called the second Adam because the first Adam was also brought into existence. If you see Genesis 2-7 in the Greek translation there, this is shown in Paul's frequent allusion to Psalm 110-1, the key text for what many term the Adam Christology. That's why passages like First uh, Philippians 2 should be explained in keeping with this view. So the first Adam wanted to be like God as something to rob, and his rebellion was counted as disobedience. That's why he was forced to be humbled by God, punishing him with the curse and forced to live like a slave that is to sin. So the second Adam, who lived like God, chose to empty himself, as per the suffering servant prophecies of Isaiah, he made himself a sheep to the slaughter, obedient to the point of death. So he chose to live like a slave, not as a punishment, but voluntarily and obediently. That's why God has super exalted his son, the Messiah, at his right hand. Again, Psalm 110, verse 1. Point three was Paul never uses the word God for Jesus. The few verses that are appealed to as proof contain textual problems, if not flat out corruptions. As I have shown, this is an ar argument made by many noted Catholic and Protest Protestant scholars over the centuries. This is not just my view here. Dr. Murray Harris, once again, in the book Jesus as, as God, says, the majority of scholars hold that the word theos, God, is applied to Jesus no fewer than five times out of a total of 1,315 times 
in the New Testament's use of the word uh, Theos, God, because, says Murray Harris, in all strands of the New Testament, the word God generally signifies the Father. My point number, and my last point, number four, for Paul, Jesus is the Lord Messiah, not the Lord God. Paul uses the title Christ, Christos, with the title Lord hundreds of times. This shows Paul's reliance on an understanding of Psalm 110, verse 1, where the word Lord is carefully distinguished uh, between Yahweh and the human Lord, Ladoni. The same with the Greek translation, where tokiriomu is never used for deity. So even though Paul now applies to Jesus' so-called Yahweh texts and even calls him the Lord of glory uh, in 1 Corinthians 2, it's all ultimately to the glory of God the Father, as he says in Philippians 2, 11. So every time Paul talks about the one God of his Shema reciting Jewish faith, he simply means the Father. Take, for example, example the classic passage in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul uses the word God ten times and applies it to, guess who? God the Father in verse 24. The Son is subordinate and in subjection to God the Father from now on until the kingdom comes and even beyond that. 1 Corinthians 15:27. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet, the Son. But when it says all things are put in subjection to the Son, it's plain that he, God, the Father, is accepted who put all things in subjection under his Son. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him so that God, the Father, that is, may be all in all. Thank you very much. All right, we actually uh, got uh, Carlos to go a few seconds over that time, so all is all all's fair here. All's fair. All right, we have now. Let's get both our debaters up on the screen. All right, sorry. And let's see here and here. And all right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to have about fifteen minutes of Q and A. From the chat now, Anthony uh, posts videos on this channel and so on. So Anthony may uh, may have more fans on in, in this group than Carlos does. So most of the questions may be directed towards Carlos. So for any of you who disagree with Anthony, this is this is a good time to toss your questions in there because I'd like to kind of go back and forth. And I want to start out with a question that was directed towards. Both of you. Well, so while everyone is posting your questions now, I'm going to give a question that was directed towards both our debaters tonight. And the question here is, um, question for Carlos, who has blood according to Acts 20, 28? And what does that entail? I want Anthony to speak on this also. So uh, you can both respond to who has blood according to Acts 20, 28. Right. Uh, Acts 20, 28. It's a very well-known variant there. So it says, keep watch over yourselves, over the whole flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers, in which you tend the church of God that he acquired with his own blood. So some translations there apply it to God uh, because there is some, again, this is a matter of so-called textual criticism. So you can go and check out Daniel Wallace, uh, Bart Ehrman, and others. But obviously, I don't believe the blood there pertains to God. Uh, if you believe God can bleed, uh, and again, when I say God, by the way, I mean God in the ultimate sense of the word. We all know that there, the Bible uses God in a secondary sense, like, of course, Moses, the judges are called gods, God, uh, the messengers, the angels are called gods, and, and so on. But obviously, there is a problem here to do with so-called textual uh, analysis, textual corruption to the text. And uh, yes, I, I, I mean, to me, it's blasphemous to think that God can somehow bleed uh, for the church. So that would be my answer. All right, Anthony, any, uh, any thoughts on that? Any response to that question? Anthony, you there? Ah, 
Turn on Sorry. your audio. All right, here we go. Yeah, uh, several things. Uh, first, just no, a reminder, no, 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 several things. Don't keep it too long. Okay. Uh, uh, as a reminder, I didn't wait bring up Acts twenty. Hello. Hang on. No, 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 no. Um, it's doing. It occasionally does something weird where it pulls up. It uh, pulls up. Uh, by, uh, by, by the way, David. Yeah. Uh, if possible, questions pertaining to Paul's uh, letters. Or oh yeah, yeah. We, we'll please, give we'll give you. we'll give more weight to questions um, that actually are, are directed towards the topic. Uh, right. We should have plenty of questions there. Um, and also, 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 guys. Uh, uh, I, you know, I read the I read the questions as fast as I can, but they come up quickly. So if you, it's doing this weird thing again where it uh, it starts doubling someone on the screen. Um, so if you guys, Anthony or Carlos, if you see a question that you would like to address, then go ahead and let me know, and we will uh, we'll get that. Anthony, could you talk real quick? I want to see if you pop back up on the screen. Uh, one, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah, you did. See? Okay. Anyway, guys, the program's doing something weird right now. Uh, you can hear their voices clearly. Um, so, um, oh, but you were, you were going to answer that, right? Did you have more of an you had more of an answer, right, Anthony? I didn't give any answer yet. Oh, okay, G give it. Give us a quick answer, and uh, <laughs> and then we'll go to a question from Carlos, then to a question from Anthony. I mean, for Anthony. Okay. So first, I didn't use Acts twenty twenty eight as a formal part of my argument, but not because it couldn't be appealed to. There's just so much in Paul to to deal with, and that's partially evident by the fact that Carlos uh, skirted most of it. Uh, but as far as Acts twenty twenty eight. Uh, notice what Carlos does here. There is a textual issue. I think textual scholars have done a great job establishing that the text really says, uh, you know, that God purchased the church with his own blood. But Carlos doesn't really have evidence for that better reading. What he says is, if you believe God can bleed, you know, that's a problem. He finds that incomprehensible. He finds that problematic. He's justifying my point that what ultimately determines his belief is not the Bible, it's not the revelation of Christ, it's what he thinks is possible. I would submit to you that you should not let human philosophy and traditions take you captive, but be captive to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his word. If his word says that he bled and he's God, then you have your answer. In fact, Paul makes this very point in 1 Corinthians 2.8, as I already pointed out, the Lord of glory was crucified. The Lord of glory is a title that comes from Psalm 24 for Yahweh, the same psalm applied repeatedly to Jesus in the New Testament. So yes, God took on a human nature, had blood, and died and bled. All right, thank you. And now we'll go to a question for Carlos, and then I'll be, while Carlos is answering this, I'll be looking for a question for Anthony. So, Carlos, this comes from A.J. Bernard. He says, question for Carlos, if Jesus is not divine, how is the sacrifice of one good man sufficient to balance the scales of the sin debt? Because Paul says it's possible. Uh, I alluded to Romans 5. And there's also Romans 8, there's uh, 1 Corinthians as well, that uh, just as through one person uh, sin, uh, sorry, I'm quoting Romans 5, 12. Therefore, Paul says, just as sin came through the, it's sin enter creation, by the way, through one human being. So what type of human being was the first Adam? Mm -hmm. I mean, in order for, for, sin to infect the whole of creation think about that and because that happened paul says now life immortality comes through the second or the last adam as he calls him in first corinthians uh, 15 i believe uh so this uh notion which is ancient uh, i i understand that well god has to bleed god has to suffer which, by the way, uh, sounds awfully, not that I'm uh, accusing you of this, Anthony, but it sounds awfully like patripatianism, as you know, an early heresy where the father uh, bleeds and suffers and dies. It sounds like, I'm not saying that's what you're proposing here, but look up those early heresies, those early, early heretical views of deity suffering, deity, the, the, in the absolute sense of the word, uh, dying, uh, and that's really the only atonement that could possibly save us, save humanity. I think that's uh, obviously beyond the biblical pale, pale. I don't believe Judaism to this day looks at it that, that way, religious Jews. Uh, the Messiah is the suffering servant of Isaiah. 
he is the sheep to the slaughter. It, it's never deity. It's never Yahweh himself somehow. That, that's not uh, in mess, messianic, uh, yeah. messianic Judaism, biblical messianic Judaism. Uh, so this notion, uh, again, look at uh, text passages like Romans 5 carefully, where Paul clearly says that because through the one human being, sin entered the whole of creation. The whole of creation. How is that possible through one a mere man, <laughs> a mere first uh, Adam? Uh, but because that happened, he says, God has declared that through the second, the last Adam, it, uh, immortality will come. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Carlos. And now we have a question for... Hey, don't, I, don't I get to respond? I don't know. You guys didn't establish any rules. Um, I could. Make I, that I, rule. I, okay, I can give you a short response, but then when you answer, he gets to give a short response. How about... Does that work? I just thought this was, that's, how worked, that's how it worked on the first question where he answered then I answered. But I, I mean, what's fair is fair. No, no, I mean, no, 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 because that 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 uh, that question was directed towards both of you. It was in the question. Good, it was directed towards oh, both see. people. All right, if you want to give see. if you want to give a quick response to what he just said, I would limit it to a minute. But then uh, I would also give him an opportunity to respond to anything you said. Pick your poison. Okay, first, Pick your poison, sir. First, uh, my view is not patripassian or even close to that. Patri, as the uh, Latin means, refers to father. And then passionism, the patropassionism means the father suffered. I haven't said the father suffered. I haven't said Jesus is the father. That's the heresy of modalism, not my view. Uh, but the idea that Christ had to be more than a man and also a divine person is clearly argued uh, on many grounds. I'll just, uh, you know, first of all, when Paul says that Christ paid for the uh, sins of the world, it's not just the transgression of the one man. It's all the transgressions after that that followed as well. But more than that, the reason Adam's sin could be, uh, you know, the entire world is the bio as well as the federal head of mankind. Of course, his sin infects the human race. What would be sufficient to root out that corruption? Is it just another man dying? I submit to you that it is not. According to Paul in Romans 1, Romans 8, the one God sent as a man to die was his son. Who He was his son prior to coming. He's not just a person who came into being uh, at the point of his conception. It's the son who comes. It's the son who dies. That's why right. Paul can say one man died, because right. it's that man, the son, who came from heaven. All right, that's a minute. Um, and uh, at times you start to sound like the uh, micro machine man, Anthony. <laughs> All right, so here is a question for Anthony, and uh, Carlos will have the opportunity to respond as well if he chooses. Uh, Michael R. Burgess Jr. says, question for Anthony, how do you answer the question of singular personal pronouns used for God? Singular personal pronouns. Uh, well, yeah, Carlos raised that. I don't, I mean, I have heard Carlos raise that in other debates. Uh, the fact is that there are singular pronouns used for uh, groups of people uh, in the Old Testament. Israel is often referred to as he and him and you. Uh, but more than that, and I think most relevant to this debate, is the fact that Paul even uses uh, singular terms to refer to both the Father and the Son. In 1 Thessalonians 3.11, for example, Paul prays, you know, may the Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. The verb there, which has the pronoun embedded in it, is may he direct, and it's referring to both the Father and the Son. So it uses a, a singular to refer to two persons. And so if a Unitarian, like Carlos or somebody else, or Carlos has done this on other occasions, wants to say singular pronoun, singular pronoun, singular pronoun, well, there's an example of Paul doing it for two persons. He does the same thing in 2 Thessalonians 2.16. That sort of thing happens throughout the New Testament. It's not an argument for Unitarianism. Doesn't establish that God is one person. All right, uh, Carlos, did you want to add anything to that, or uh, just quickly? It's interesting that when uh, Israel is brought up, uh, Israel is sometimes called uh, uh, um, by singular personal pronouns. Then, when I ask the question, "So, are you saying that God is a nation or like a nation?" I usually get a no. And then when I say, "Well, are you saying God is a group of people?" Then I still get a no. So I don't know exactly what that is supposed to uh, tell us about God, uh, but singular personal pronouns are, are used for Jesus himself when he says the Father is the only true God, and uh, and obviously Paul follows that up in in his letters. So that's all. All right, and um, 
this isn't uh, this isn't really directed towards anyone in particular. I just wanted to answer it very quickly because this has come up like probably 50 times in the chat. <laughs> People are asking why this debate is on the Apostle Paul. Why is it limited to the Apostle Paul and, and not just does right. the Bible teach it? Uh, guys, just it, it's good to be specific sometimes, right? I mean, you can have a debate on the existence of God. Uh, you can get more specific than that. Um, you can uh, examine a particular argument, but um, so you can you could take the entire um, you can take the entire Bible. You could take the New Testament. You could take a particular book. You could say, "Does Matthew teach that Jesus is God? Does Mark teach it? Jesus is God?" But uh, if uh, both of these gentlemen believe in the authority of the teaching of, of the Apostle Paul, it's perfectly relevant to say, "Does Paul teach that Jesus is God?" So I hope that cleared that up to everyone who was bringing it up. Uh, you guys have anything to add to that, or would you agree to that? I'll just say, I'll just say, well said, David. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. And one thing is, I uh, Carlos had approached me to debate, and he actually debated some other topics I would have loved to have debated with him. But since he already did those topics, I, I just said, okay, let's mm -hmm. do this one. Yep. So that's part of the reason for it. I mean, yeah. you can't, you yeah. have to frame it differently, yeah. and you know, keep people interested. Yeah, and 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 I would add, it's also good because. Um, uh, if it was just, if the topic was simply, uh, if the topic were simply, uh, you know, does the Bible teach that Jesus is God? You'd be focusing on a lot of things. You'd be focusing primarily uh, on, you know, the teachings of Jesus. So Paul would only play a minor role in a debate like that. So it's good to just focus on the Apostle Paul. Um, speaking of the Apostle Paul, here's a question for Carlos. Yeah. Uh, Breakfast Gun uh, says, is Paul explicitly calling Jesus God in Romans 9.5? Uh, to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Right. Uh, again, that's one of the so-called uh, problematic, and that's a language that uh, evangelical scholars, Protestant scholars use, Catholic scholars use. These are problem texts. So again, you have to go to the books there, you have to do your own study, and, and uh, convince, uh, be convinced in your own mind. I quoted um, Meyer, uh, Meyer's New Testament, which is a very standard, uh, well-known uh, uh, commentary that he clearly thought that only the Father is the only true God, not in Romans 9.5. So again, it's a matter of uh, w what's called textual uh, criticism, which is a very long and tedious process. But if you want to get serious about this, and you know, not all of us are teachers, pastors, but uh, yes, I... I, I would uh, recommend that you look at the scholarship done on, on those texts, like Romans 9.5. So. All right. And um, now we have a question for Anthony. Uh, guys, I'm trying to focus on questions. Wait. What's that? Wait, do I, get a res do I get a minute response? Yes, but again, he'll get a minute response to your next question. So is that the route you want to go? <laughs> yeah, I thought we were going okay. that route. Okay, okay, you can have a minute response, and then he gets to respond <laughs> to your question, which he is going to want to respond to. Go ahead. Okay, one, I think I think Carlos is confusing things here. There are textual variations in the manuscripts that we have, but that doesn't mean that every place we don't like is a, a matter of textual variance. Romans 9.5 has no serious textual variant that uh, is discussed by scholars. That's not what the issue is in Romans 9.5. What some people want to argue is that it should be translated differently. That's where the, the conversation needs to be. And I would argue, as all schol I mean, most scholars at least, the natural reading of the Greek grammar and syntax there is that Christ is being referred to as God overall. But more than that, it follows contextually. Paul is listing the great privileges that belong to Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sons, theirs is the law, theirs is the divine glory. And then he says, uh, from them is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is God overall. The very statement that he's... he's presupposes that he's not from them, and Paul answers it by saying he's God overall. So the, the context uh, is, is in agreement with the most natural reading of the grammar. Christ is called God overall by Paul, just like he's called God in Titus 2.13, and I would disagree with Carlos's rebuttal of that earlier. All right, uh, question for Anthony here, and then Carlos can respond. Uh, Munib Zia says question for anthony and I, I i've been trying to look for questions that are actually focusing on the apostle paul but there aren't a lot of questions for anthony so um just rolling with the ones here that are for anthony question for anthony do you worship the human nature alongside the divine nature of jesus when you worship him how is that not blasphemy is there any way to worship just the divine nature in christ 
Yeah, I think that's a little bit silly. Even even apart from the idea of an incarnation or a person with two natures, if somebody asks, you know, do you honor your wife's toenail or something like that? I'm honoring her by, you know, uh, working hard and providing for her and those sorts of things. You know, but but to ask this of a divine person, it, it's not it's not that Christ is two persons that I would split him up into a human person and a divine person. It's one person who is both human and divine. And it's the, the object of my worship is that person who is both human and divine. So I don't, you know, separate out the natures and say I, I'm worshiping his, his body or his foot or something like that. I'm worshiping the person of Christ. The bigger problem is for the Unitarian who doesn't think it's a divine person, but still talks about praying to him as Lord in heaven, something no Jew would do, Paul would not do, because for Paul as a Jew, there's only one Lord, only one Lord that you're to call upon, and that Lord, Paul says, is the Lord Jesus. All right, uh, Anthony, uh, I mean, uh, Carlos, did you want to respond to that? Oh, just quickly, I think it's very problematic. It's confusing to, so so if you believe Jesus is God, when you worship and pray to him, you, you must, if you have to be consistent, you must just be having your head, the deity part only, not the human part, because we get attacked, we get criticized for saying, well, we pray and worship Jesus as the human being that he is, according to texts like 1 Timothy 2.5. So you have to be consistent. Uh, otherwise, you have to somehow uh, educate your mind and your heart and your soul to, when you worship and pray Jesus, in your head, you have to say, oh, I'm only doing the deity part here, not the human part, so I don't fall into some kind of a, a Trinitarian uh, blasphemy. All right. Um, here we have a question for Carlos that is about the Apostle Paul. Uh, sure. So hey, Luke says, for Carlos, do you know what Old Testament passage Paul is uh, taking and applying to Christ in Ephesians 4, 7 through 10? Uh, not offhand. I have to Ephesians. No problem. Yep. It's Psalm, Psalm 68. Right. Go ahead and pull it up. Yep. Yep, and so if the question was, no, I didn't, and so it's Psalm 68. Uh, yeah, I'll go, I'll go and read the passage real quick. Uh, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts oh. to men. In saying mm -hmm. he ascended, so Anthony referred to this earlier. Uh, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. So uh, I, I guess he's not just asking, do you know the Old Testament passage? <laughs> I, I guess he's asking you for your interpretation of this. Okay, my interpretation of Ephesians 4 is... Uh, that basically here it's talking about the resurrection so now what does it mean that he ascended in other words that he was raised to life to immortality and was uh, uh, went up to heaven that's because he was dead and that's how I understand descended to the lower regions note there right the, the lower regions earth right under the earth and it says right there, to the lower parts of the earth. So the one who was dead, in verse 10, who descended, is the one who was raised to life. Uh, yeah, that's how I... Yeah. Uh, and, and my response to that is, uh, Psalm 68 is talking about God triumphing and then ascending into heaven. Paul applies that to Jesus, and then he asks the natural question... He ascend, he first descended. In other words, since this psalm about God talks about him going up, it assumes he first came down. Paul's applying that to Jesus. When it says that he descended to the lower regions, it doesn't mean uh, under the earth, as you said. That's a Hebrew idiom referring to the earth. That's appositional there in the Greek. In fact, the same terminology is used by David in Psalm 139 to refer to his being formed in his mother's womb. So when it speaks of him descending to the lower parts of the earth, it's referring to him coming and being born uh, of Mary. And so that is a descent passage which precedes Christ's ascent. And so the, the argument is 
God can't ascend unless he first descends, but Christ did ascend, therefore he must have first descended. In other words, Christ is God. All right, uh, now we have a question for uh, Anthony, and then Carlos will have an opportunity to respond, although I think this is coming from a f coming from a supporter of Anthony and not a critic. Guys, if you're critics of Anthony, now is your time to ask questions about Anthony's positions. Bring it on. Okay. Medic for Christ says, uh, question for Anthony, Romans 8, 38 to 39 says, love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does the phrase here mean, and does it point to divinity? That, that's a question for me. It says, question for Anthony. You're Anthony, aren't you? It says, Romans... Uh, sometimes. What? It depends oh, yeah. who I'm talking to. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh... uh the person said Romans 8.38. Uh, they must be referring to Romans 8.38 to 39 says, Love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does the phrase here mean, and does it point uh, to divinity? So you can say... Okay, well, in, in that passage, I would, there's two divine terms that are being used there, the, uh, God and Lord. It speaks of the love of God, and it speaks of Jesus our Lord. I've established in Paul that Lord means Yahweh. That's how he uses it for Jesus. I take love here to the Father, and that love is in Christ Jesus our Lord, another divine person. Uh, but notice uh, that Paul's whole argument here, by the way, is that uh, it was the Son that God gave to redeem mankind, and therefore it's not possible for a person purchased by the Son to be lost or be separated from God's love. That assumes a very high view of Jesus and his personhood as the Son. If God could have atoned for us and, and saved us by someone other than that, surely God would have done so. Why would he have sent his own son to the cross if any person could have died uh, and, and it, could have, it could have just been some other perfect man or something like that? Uh, Carlos, did you want to uh, respond to any of that? Just quickly, I would have appealed to almost 100% of the time where the word God is applied to the Father only. All the text, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, at the least five, at the most maybe seven or nine, have textual or punctuation grammatical issues, as Anthony has uh, appointed to. So here uh, in 39, I see from the love of God in Christ. That sounds awfully similar, like 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God was in Christ. Yes, of course, Colossians 2, 9, the deity was in Christ. I mean, it would be odd to me anyway, if Jesus is... Uh, God, in the ultimate sense of the word, for him to repeatedly talk about God in Christ. So you might want to think about that. Did you say uh, we can ask, ask questions for the chat from the chat to? Uh, if if you, I mean, we're we're uh, we're uh, at sixteen minutes right now. But if there was a question that you saw if, that you wanted to could, answer, yeah. Well, if I could throw this one out to Anthony, is that okay? Yeah. Is yes, this is I'm this from, is this from the chat? Yes. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, because because I I know I remember seeing uh because I'm scrolling through when I'm looking for questions for you, then I see a couple questions for Anthony, but I kind of have to pass them uh, until no I until I'm looking for questions for Anthony, and then I have to skip questions that are directed towards you. But uh, yeah, if you saw one that you'd like Anthony to address, go ahead. It's all good. Uh, for Paul, Anthony, how many Yahwehs are there? One, two, or three? Yeah, <laughs> that's Anthony Buzzard's question, isn't it? Uh. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that because I did see that in the chat, and I thought it was from uh, him. Was it? Just, just a curiosity. Uh, probably, yes. Okay. Probably. Thank you, Anthony, a fellow Anthony, for the question. Um, now, for Paul, there's one Lord. I mean, I, I've pointed this out repeatedly, that if you set aside, as Carlos must, those Yahweh texts that are used for the Father, and he has to set them aside because they're also used for Jesus, so they, they somehow can't count. Right. If you set them aside, the Father is never called Lord by Paul, and he's not called the one Lord. First Corinthians 8, 6, Ephesians 4, 5. Jesus is called the one Lord. So if we're just restricting it in, in terms of the logic of the way Carl is the one Lord. Now, of course, I don't reject those Lord texts being used for the Father. I accept the whole of Scripture. I don't reject any of it. I think the Father is Lord. I don't think that makes two Lords, because I think that Jesus shares the same nature, the same essence as the Father. They are numerically one as to their essence. That's the upshot of a text like Colossians 2.9, where it says that in Christ dwells 
all the fullness of deity in bodily form. That doesn't mean, as Carlos says, we must be deity because later it talks about us being the fullness in him. The whole point is because Christ is the fullness of deity, in him we have all we need. He is all sufficient for us. So, so my answer is there is only one Lord, and if we want to speak in one sense, we could say it's the Father and the Son and the Spirit, by the way, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, but in terms of just Paul's language, in, most of the time, Jesus is the only one he refers to as Lord, most of the time. All right, so, uh, Carlos, for, yes, the, for, for the sake of fairness, you do get a, qu a quick response. Yes, actually, that was uh, I was just reading the Brandon asked that question, but I think Anthony oh. also asked a similar one. Um, the The multiple Yahwehs is 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 quite extraordinary, and that's why I got into this whole debating stuff because it's amazing to me. We can talk I, about. I didn't, say, hmm? I didn't say multiple Yahwehs. Multiple persons who are Yahweh. There's one Yahweh. That Yahweh is identified as Father and Son. All right. So at thank least, you. I mean, Thank yeah. you. Multiple persons. So the Father is Yahweh, the Son is Yahweh. Um, um, I think it's a matter of uh, the agency stuff, which is interesting. Uh, the agent is being confused with the principle, and this is done with the angels of, of the Lord Yahweh. Uh, by the way, in the Qumran uh, cave, they found Yahweh texts applied to Melchizedek. So please Google that. Qumran, Yahweh text to Melchizedek. Yep. And in the Bible itself, uh, in the in the Old Testament, uh, Moses Moses, in the Old Moses speaks uh, uh, as Yahweh in Deuteronomy 29. The prophets oftentimes speak as Yahweh in the first person. Isaiah 53, Hosea 5, Habakkuk, or, or Zechariah, and so on. So to say that just because they do that, this is a, a Hebraism, if you will, uh, and and then. Uh, talk about multiple persons as Yahweh, I think that's simply mistaking the agents of the one Yahweh for Yahweh himself or themselves. All right. Uh, thank you for those. And since we are, uh, we've gone, we've gone a little over time now, but I don't want to end on this note. So I would just want to give, this is, this wasn't on the schedule, but just wanted to give uh, each one of our debaters uh, about a minute to a minute and a half for any final thoughts that they wanted to uh, basically share or tell people where to go. Or um, uh, I, I have, I have their, their bios in the description box. So if you wanted to go to any uh, sites or get any more information, you can go there. Uh, but I just wanted to give uh, Anthony about a minute to 90 seconds and then Carlos uh, as well for any final thoughts or any final words for everyone who's watching. Okay, yeah, I just want to close by saying, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thankful to Carlos for engaging in this debate. I think these issues are serious and they're important, and that's why I've made some very... Uh, some points very pointedly. It's not because I don't like Carlos. I think Carlos is a great guy. I do think his position departs from Scripture. I think it's idolatrous. I don't think uh, that it involves a saving confession of Christ to call upon him as something less than Lord in its absolute and true sense, as uh, I think I've established in the debate. So I think these are important issues. I hope people will continue to search in, into them, even go back through the debate and see what arguments were made, what arguments were lost in the debate, which ones were misunderstood and responded too well. I think that greatly, and uh, you know, I'd encourage you to continue to read the sources that have been referred to in this debate as well. So I'll conclude with that. All right. Thank you, Anthony. And Carlos, any, uh, any final thoughts for everyone who's watching? Thank you, Anthony, for your kind words. Uh, I understand this is, I agree totally. It's a serious matter. Uh, we're very sometimes jovial and, you know, we, I think we do like each other. Uh, and and that's great. I mean, uh, and and thank you for accepting this invitation because these are matters of life and death, as we all know. John seventeen three is one of our go to texts, as as you guys know. Um, eternal life consists in knowing the Father as the only one who is true God, and of course our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He is my Lord, my Savior. He's not just a mere man, or you know. He's obviously a super exalted, unique uh, human being. He's the second Adam. I thank you, uh, David, for your professionalism. And moderating is as uh, sometimes as taxing as us preparing all this stuff for the audience. Please go to focusonthekingdom.org. One word, focusonthekingdom.org. And the human Jesus, 
Org website if you want to know more about this line of thinking uh, that it's called biblical Unitarianism or uh, as I describe myself Christian Unitarian there are alternatives to those all those texts we brought up so please check it out and I hope uh, we can all be convinced in our own minds of, of obviously the faith uh, that we have confessed in front of so many witnesses. Once again, guys, thank you for, mm -hmm. for your uh, friendliness. And and yes, thank you. All right. Thank you to our debaters and to everyone for watching. We look forward to many more discussions like this on Christian theology. God bless everyone.